and uh, the basics of lung ultrasound thank you for being here and joining us for this uh, workshop let's start today's session if anybody has any query then uh, please put it in the chat box uh for the first class i will invite dr uh, ravi parek sir uh, sir, uh, sir has then uh, his mrcp ch and frcp ch then he did two years of clinical fellowship in functional eco uh, at uh, uh, birmingham women's hospital including research paper on pda then uh, sir has also done his certified uh, completion of specialist training in neonatology he was a newborn life uh, life support instructor of resuscitation counseling of uh, london and currently he is practicing as a consultant neonatologist and director setu newborn care center uh, sir is going to take a class on basic ppha uh, pda indices uh, welcome sir over to you sir thank you dr vilas for kind introduction so today we are going to learn about pda uh, very briefly because we are more focused towards the uh, indices of pda on echo i will just very briefly in 5 minutes uh, go through a pda why it is important because lot of premature babies are now saved so how important pda is and i then i will show you all the indices and which you need to practically learn on the hands on training on uh, friday uh, so we'll start my uh, talk now so we know pda is undeniably one of the most frequent problems encountered in premature babies we know how the more the premature baby the uh, pda problem is more so it is inversely related to gestational age in uh, less than 1000 gram it is present in almost 55 to 70% and in less than 750 gram it is definitely increase but why why okay pda was there before as well uh, and now more uh, preterms are saved but why pda is uh, we are learning and uh, is causing some problems which we will go through so if we learn from our basics then we know that in term babies what will happen is uh, the pda functional closure happens by our, uh, around 15 hours because uh, there is a abrupt contraction of muscular wall of P of the pda associated with increase in arterial pdo so uh, two thing two important things happen at birth baby cries so uh, the lungs uh, get open uh, pulmonary pressures drop and oxygen goes to the body and you cut the cord as well so that systemic pressure also increase and this this all things will cause a functional closure by about 15 hours and anatomical closure may take several weeks but very important thing is that duct cannot reopen in uh, a term baby so if we want to keep duct open in especially in uh, congenital heart disease then we have to give additional med medication so that's the characteristic of duct in term babies but there is different in preterm babies because there is a diminished contractile responsiveness it can re remain open and once it has started closing but if there is an episode of sepsis or child becomes very sick it can reopen as well so we know that in premature babies uh, lower gestation sick baby lack of antenatal steroids and surfactant efficiency are all there so why why there is a problem with duct because what happens is uh, in a preterm baby what it causes is a redistribution of blood it connects the aorta to pulmonary artery so the when the heart pumps the blood which goes through aorta comes from the pulmonary artery back to the lungs as well so it can cause pulmonary over circulation in lungs and it can still the it's called a still phenomena it can cause systemic hypoperfusion in intestines kidneys muscles and skin so what it can cause it has been attributed to large pd has been attributed to intraventricular hemorrhage uh, it has been attributed to nec it has been attributed to chronic lung disease because of constant pulmonary flooding and it can acutely cause pulmonary hemorrhage so in some babies it can be a problematic as well so now we are learning uh, assessment of pda as well before what we were we what we were doing is we were when i when even I, actually i started my uh, post graduation back in to uh, 1999 to 2002 we were only clinically assessing the duct so continuous murmur hyperdynamic precordium full and bounding pulse or a wide pulse pressure more than 20 mm of mercury but what we have learned throughout the years as well is that 
the clinical signs are poor predictor of PDA in first week of life, especially. So clinical examination cannot be re relied to diagnose or exclude significant doctors. So that is important. So, so early and accurate echocardiography is a gold standard in diagnosing or excluding PDA. So pre as, as I told, uh, so obviously there are another thoughts as well that Previously, we were not treating PDA and now we are, we are selectively treating PDA. So what is the difference? So basically, there is a wide range of ductal constriction and large left to right shunt can occur early and clinical signs are late because after seven days only continuous murmur and things will be visible. So by echocardiography, we have to establish early hemodynamic significance. So as we... Uh, as we classify birth asphyxia or perinatal asphyxia or HI with mild, moderate and severe, the same thing we have to do in PDA because we don't want to unnecessarily treat the baby and those babies who has significant PDA, we have to treat and prevent these uh, side effects which I have showed you. So the most important thing is to establish early hemodynamic significance and this is what we want to learn today from my talk and then practically those indices on Friday, uh, all the mentors will show you. So this is very important. Okay. So any, whenever you start to learn echocardiography, and even though if you want to just learn for seeing that the PDA is patent or not, you cannot do a shortcut. You cannot just see a short axis view of PDA uh, and do the echo and then treat the baby. First, there are four things you have to see. Is the heart structure really normal? Because you have to scan the first scan any baby even though you are just want to look at pda has to be full because we know the side effects there are certain uh, certain heart disease which are duct dependent for example if there is a coarctation of aorta and if there is a large duct and you treat it then it actually you will be in a problem as well so first you have to do a full scan to see if the heart is structurally normal and then second question is if the is the duct patent yes or no and if it is patent, what is the shunt direction? Left to right or right to left? And the last important thing, because now we want to act whether the duct is uh, uh, causing problem or not, then that there are indices which tell is the duct significant. So these are the four very, very important questions you have to uh, ask and demonstrate on ECHO before you uh, uh, conclude that the PDS PDA needs treatment. So you will uh, learn in that uh, today in the all the views as well you are going to learn plus you will learn on the on Friday as well. The first thing is the, is the duct patent. So the best way to look is in the short axis view. So uh, around two o'clock uh, your cursor will be there or two o'clock position. Doctor Moit will tell you about that as well. Uh, or a little bit modified short axis, a little bit up that is called a PDA view as well. But it can be easily seen in the short axis as well. So that's the uh, thing. So you sweep, sweep, swipe from the uh, heart to the pulmonary artery. So that will show you when the uh, when uh, they are when you are learning the uh, different views. So uh, Dr. Mohit or whoever is looking at doing that thing, they will show you. So you swipe from the heart apex of the heart to the pulmonary artery and. When you see the two pulmonary artery in short axis, if there is a patent that you will see at that position. So this is this is the PDA. So normally there are two uh, right and left pulmonary artery, but when you when you get uh, uh, efficient in the uh, scans, you will you you can easily demonstrate on uh, 2D appearance there as a three leg appearance. You can see there are three leg on on, on the so the third one is the patent ductus arteries. So sometimes. Uh, while you are learning, it will be difficult to demonstrate in 2D. So you then you can apply the color and you can uh, you can see this is a typical duct. This is a left to right shunt, the red color uh, or orange color duct is there. Uh, if, when you are doing into the color uh, color uh, Doppler, then uh, the narrowest position of the whole duct you you have to scan and then demonstrate. So here, if you can see the length, uh, so the width is. Uh, three uh, zero point three centimeters, so three millimeter duct is there. So that is quite large duct. So if here, and this is an alternate view. So if you want to confirm after short axis view, you can do the arch view as well. And when you see the uh, the proper arch, and you just little bit swipe it, you can see the duct in that view as well. So the most common is the short axis view, but in this view also you can see the duct as well. And this is the duct which has a length of one point six. So it is a moderate. 
uh, 1.6 millimeter. So that was a three millimeter. This is 1.6 millimeter. So this is a moderate PDA. So this is the what you have first learned is a identification of duct and the size of duct. So that is the first index. If you want to note it down, what you need to learn on Friday, then you can note it down. This is a first indices of the PDA. So whether whether the duct is present or not, and if it is present, what is the size of the duct? And what is the, uh, sorry, and then the shunt direction. So th then second important question is, if the duct is present, what is the shunt direction? So you will commonly, once you start learning, you will more than 90%, you will see left to right shunting, which is very common. Sometimes then that is a red color. Uh, and sometimes by red, bi-directional shunting also you will see if there is more PPH and then bi-directional shunting also can be seen. So red and blue both color. Right to left shunting is very difficult to see identify without uh, experience. And especially in very, very sick baby only you will see. So at present, what you need to learn when you are starting to learn is to uh, see uh, the left to right shunting, which is a, a duct, which is a red or orange in color. So now what we have established is duct is there, size of the duct, the shunting of the duct. And now we want to ourselves know whether the shunt is significant or not. Thus, does this PDA needs treatment or not? So there, there are two important things. Again, echocardiographic parameters are there. And then the clinical uh, clinical effect consistent with large duct that is heart failure is there significant hypotension is there if you if the baby is on significant high oxygen you have already given surfactant to them and still the oxygen remains high then those are the clinical indirect signs which you can also think of that this can be the duct as well we recently had a baby preterm baby actually baby was 35 week only so we did, never thought that it was a baby already had RDS. We gave surfactant and then still baby was not improving. And there was a right and left and, uh, left atrium were very dilated as well. So then uh, we had to give IV paracetamol to that baby. So always there is a clinical judgment as well. And uh, that will give you the guide that there might be a problem. And then, but the most important thing is the echocardiographic parameters. So these are just a little bit of some studies from where all these parameters have Come, I'm not going into detail, but there are, are different there? studies what? over what? the years which has evolved, which what has come out that? that these are the ductal parameters which we need to learn to see that whether the duct is significant as well. So the ductal diameter, LAO ratio, uh, uh, normal or retrograde uh, flow in the duct ductus or as aorta or superior mesenteric artery and uh, and uh, LA, LVDD or by AO ratio. But so what are, whatever common things are there, uh, we will uh, go through in next few slides. So here is a, it was a significant uh, study was there and which is, which learned that in first 24 or less than 31 hours of, uh, uh, 31 hours of life, if you do a PDA diameter, LAO ratio, LVO index and uh, uh, aortic Doppler flow, then you have to, you, you can, you have a good ability to predict significant PDA. So that's what we want to learn. So defining large PDA in less than 48 hours, baby. So duct diameter, I told you, if the ductal diameter is more than 1.5 millimeter at the age of 19 hours, then uh, so in first 24 hours, then baby requiring treatment of PDA closure, uh, the sensitivity and specificity is very high. So first thing what we have learned is a ductal diameter. So second thing you note down is what you need to learn on Friday is LAO ratio. So LAO ratio is uh, you you will do it in the long axis. In the long axis, so you get this uh, this uh, picture of left atrium aorta and left atrium. So once you do the M mode, through and M mode should be as perpendicular as possible to left atrium uh, and aortic wall. Uh, so that as perpendicular as possible. And when you put the M mode, it will come out like this. So this is the left atrium and this is the aorta. So you do the LA by AO ratio. So more the left atrium will be dilated, the ratio will be high. So that means the duct is significant. So here the LAO ratio you can see is 1.6 uh, millimeter. But you see the next slide, see the how large the atrium, uh, left atrium is there. So here the left atrium is quite large. So your LAO ratio here comes at 
1.15, which is significant. So more than 1.5 of LAO ratio is also significant. So first we have learned is a is the duct there? Yes, if duct is there, uh, what is the duct size? Then what is the shunt of the duct? And then LAO ratio. Now fourth thing is Doppler flow patterns. This is also very important. So the pulmonary. So if there is a significant pulmonary hypertension, then you will see this pattern. Uh, uh, once uh, in the growing phase, the pattern will be like this. But whenever the uh, duct will be very significant uh, with good good amount of uh, contraction, mm -hmm. then you will see a pulsatile pattern where systolic and diastole both you will see, and then. Uh, the systole will be there and the diastole will go up. So that will be the closing pattern. And this is a closed pattern. So this pattern you need to understand as well. So uh, so this is a Doppler for pattern. So what we are worried is this growing and pulsatile pattern are the significant ductus pattern. If it is a closing pattern or closed pattern, then we don't need to worry. So the ductal hemodynamic significance is there when there is a growing and pulsatile pattern. So this is the fourth index. And then the di diastolic flow in mesenteric artery or descending aorta. I will show you in the next slide. But the theory behind this is uh, that ductal steel, if there is a lot of shunting through the duct, then it will cause uh, ductal steel and it can cause gut, gut ischemia as well. So there will be reduced absent or reverse mesenteric artery flow. And it can be measured in uh, descending aorta as well, but it can be easily measured in the uh, mesenteric artery as well. So here, while you are doing the situs view, they will show you uh, on Friday. When you are doing the uh, situs view, the superior mesenteric artery will be there. Uh, then there you have to put the pulse wave Doppler on the artery and this. So here, this is a normal one because the systole is also there and diastole is as, as well. But if there is an absent diastolic flow, then this systole will be here and the diastole will not be there. So these are the mesenteric artery Doppler. So this also we need to learn. And lastly, uh, what you need to learn is the myocardial functional assessment. So the, here there are a lot of indices are there. When you learn the advanced uh, uh, echocardiography, then you will come to know. But at present, what you can see is the eyeballing the heart, whether the myocardial function is good or not. Generally, if it is a large PD and it is affecting the heart, then there the, it will start affecting the contractility of heart as well. Fractional shortening also you can do. The fractional shortening, uh, they will cover it uh, as well in the output and everything. Left ventricular output and right ventricular output, SVC flow and tissue Doppler imaging. This you can put it as a, as a part to learning. But uh, up till now, what we have learned is uh, the patency is there, size of the duct is there. LAO ratio is there, shunting of the duct is there, Doppler flow uh, is a uh, pattern of the duct on the Doppler flow, and then whether in the superior mesenteric artery, whether the, there is a normal pattern or absent uh, pattern, so whether there is a ductal seal or not. And lastly, the myocardial functional assessment. So when we put everything together, plus See, when you learn neonatology, it is not black and white that this is exactly what is there. You see the baby, you see the clinical features, and you see the echocardiograph signs. But significantly, you can predict early that this duct is significant. If ductal diameter is more than 2, LAO ratio is more than 1.5, growing or pulsatile Doppler flow pattern, mesentric or aortic diastolic flow, and if there is evidence of decreased myocardial function. So now we know uh, that currently uh, the best approach is early eco-targeted treatment. So uh, within actually uh, rather than two days, even within 24 hours, you can target any premature babies less than 28 weeks with echocardiography. Establish the hemodynamic significance as I shown above with above parameters. Treat medically and wait for response. So, in summary, clinical science appears very late. We know that ECHO is essential for accurate diagnosis. There are a number of uh, ECHO findings which I have already told and uh, hemodynamically significant duct is best made, defined by number of ECHO and clinical features. Early uh, targeted ECHO cardiography is best approach and further research is ongoing. So, this I end this lecture at present and I am happy to uh, answer any questions which you have got. Uh, thank you, sir. I hope it was clear. Yeah. Yeah, sir. It was uh, clear. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful talk on the basics of uh, PDA indices. Sir, as there is a no question in chat box, 
i think okay. uh, every everyone is well aware about uh, pda in the icis i have uh, time little bit just one minute yes sir okay so now see once you start learning all these indices uh, then again you have to put all these things into your clinical picture as well see if you have a 32 34 weeker baby or even 31 33 weeker baby who is in air okay no no oxygen requirement is there there is no distress at all and baby is very well even if you have like a 2 2.2 millimeter duct then it's not that it is a hemodynamically significant duct and you treat it. So always as a neonatologist, you, you will go through uh, all, even uh, your baby as well, clean how the baby, what are the clinical features of the baby and what is the significant. Obviously, if this finding is there in a ventilated baby less than 28 weeks, uh, then you definitely want to treat a duct because that can cause what we I showed you is a pulmonary hemorrhage and all those things. So your clinical judgment, and things are also important. So when you start learning ECO, you learn properly and then you apply all these things. And over the years, you will understand uh, uh, that how you treat the PDA. So that's important because still, if you see in a lot of conference, there will be a debate. Will you treat PDA or not? But it is not like black and white picture that, yes, you treat this PDA, you don't treat the food everything in the context your baby your echocardiography findings what are the uh, what are the positive what if i treat what what i will get benefit because all the medicines will have side effect as well so it is a whole picture which you need to learn but at present you have a good opportunity on friday to learn all the pda indices and i, I hope you will grab this opportunity thank you very much thank you sir uh if anybody has any query, you can put it in chat box. Okay, sir. Thank you. Can we go ahead? Thank you. Very nice, Thank you, Dr. Uh, let's move forward to the next session for this. I will invite Dr. Kiran Mori, sir. Sir, are you there? Yes. Already. Okay. Yeah. Should I start? Uh, uh, yeah, sir. Uh, okay. Sir, I will give a short intro. Then you can start, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, uh, sir is a, a former HOD. And, uh, uh, sir, sir is a DND neonatology super specialty teacher and IAP or NNF NISU fellowship program supervisor. Uh, sir was former neonatal targeted eco fellow at Sick Kids Toronto. Canada and he was a neonatal fellow uh, at uh, Royal, Ch uh, Royal Children's Hospital, Australia. And uh, he also did a, a, scholar, a scholar research training from Harvard University, Boston, and uh, also ECMO diploma at La Petite Hospital, France. Uh, sir was a former HOD, NISU BJ Wadia Children's Hospital, Mumbai, former neonatal consultant, Sidra Medicine, Qatar, and Christchurch Hospital, New Zealand. Now, uh, sir is currently working as a senior neonatal consultant and head of department, department leader for clinical research, MRR Children's Hospital, Thane. Sir is going to teach you basics uh, of shock indices in ECO. Welcome, sir. Over to you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Vilas. Thank you for nice question. Thank you, sir. So, how much time I have? 20 minutes or 25? Sir, 30 to 35 minutes. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. So... Uh, okay, let's start. So shock is a, I mean, PDA, PPHN and shock. These are the three basic talk, topics we always talk about in hemodynamics. Shock uh, is very important uh, because we have, we, we all encounter lots of babies getting into sudden hemodynamic decompensation. And many times we, we, we do uh, take decision on clinical aspects 
but uh, echo is one tool which definitely helps you in decision making in such scenarios i'll just start a case scenario quickly so which you might have encountered so 26 week or 800 grams 33 weeks corrected on a high flow very stable fully fed and during the handover was told that his baby is stable and then developed lethargy apneas oxygen requirement poor perfusion and abnormal decision within few hours and then uh, baby becomes sick so the differentials at this stage are sepsis neck less likely because uh, very late uh, to happen but can happen right so, normally what you would do is intubate ventilate, right? I started antibiotics, saline bolus was given. And cap refill was 3 seconds, warm peripheries. Blood pressure was acceptable, 46 by 32. And uh, I did the echo and it was good contractility. High cardiac, high LVO and adequate filling. Yeah. So, the cardiac output was very high. 560 mLs per kilo per minute. And... Uh, oh. 1452. Yeah, 1452. 560ml per kilo per minute. And uh, but the good contractility was there. So this baby is in an early warm shock. So this is very typically when babies go into sepsis in early warm shock, you get a very high cardiac output. And in the later stage, you get cold shock where the cardiac output falls. So uh, the uh, so inotropes were ordered. The protocol was not epinephrine. You, you may choose dopamine or anything else, but uh, nor if he was given, saline boluses were given. But within a few hours, baby developed quite significant metabolic acidosis, increasing lactate, steroids were given, uh, baby deteriorated very rapidly, and then the blood pressure dropped, become very mortal, lactic acidosis, and then epinephrine was started, baby developed DIC, and uh, about 8 to 12 hours later, baby succumbed. So, and you wonder, like, you know, uh, the diagnosis was E. coli sepsis, fulminant E. coli sepsis, and it was an ESBL. Unfortunately, uh, it was a very resistant bug. It didn't respond to the second line antibiotic we started. So despite all the efforts, we felt, okay, you know, the baby died and what else we could have done? We felt we did everything. Now, what went wrong? Why we lost the baby? What we could have done better? So I think that's where uh, sometime early picking up uh, of these babies is very important. Rational use of antibiotics or correct antibiotics. All these things matter to save these babies. But uh, uh, it's important to understand exactly what goes on when the babies actually get decompensated. And that's why understanding the, the hemodynamics is very, very important to manage these babies. So, so unfortunately, the problem in newborn is the clinical parameters are often late and they are missed. So we may not, you know, have a enough information all the time or uh, we rely on a lot of parameters which may not be very valuable in telling the true story. So cap refill time, yes, it's important. And we do it all the time. And that's the first question, what's the CRT? But it has limited accuracy in predicting low cardiac output. So I'll be talking a lot on the cardiac output because in shock, what matters is a tissue perfusion. So what is your output? What is your tissue perfusion? That matters than the other parameters. So cap refill may not predict uh, the um, uh, the low uh, cardiac output. Blood pressure also, unfortunately, may not tell you the whole story because it might be normal in presence of a severe cardiogenic shock, but a compensated shock or hemorrhagic shock because in these cases, your cardiac output might be low, but babies will have a high SVR and will compensate to produce a normal blood pressure. So you might be fooled that there is nothing going on, but baby is actually decompensating. Or you might have, like in this baby, sepsis, the blood pressure initially was acceptable because this baby had warm shock been dropping in the systemic vascular resistance, but it was compensated by a high cardiac output. So when this happens, the blood pressure may remain normal. So that's why blood pressure doesn't tell the whole story. And that's why we need to know what is happening with the cardiac output? We need to know what is happening with the SVR, which is very difficult to measure, but can be indirectly uh, calculated with your help of your systolic diastolic blood pressure. Now, urine output lactate are also late signs. By the time baby has started dropping urine and lactate is rising, pH is dropping, then you have already missed the bus. And all these signs of clinical uh, uh, signs of compromised uh, perfusion have sensitivity only 50 to 70%. And that's why 
uh, baby is often present with uncompensated or ir irreversible shock and despite you feel like we did everything humne to sab kiya do anatrop thi and anatrop steroid sab kuch diya lekin baby did not survive so that's why early prediction early intervention ongoing monitoring and aggressive treatment is often needed uh, for the shock management uh, i'll just before going on to the indices quickly i'll brush up the phys physiology or the concepts of shock because echo indices is nothing but assessing all these parameters individually and that will tell us the story what's exactly going on in the baby so for a metabolic homeostasis for a body to function for the cells to function you need to have a adequate cellular metabolism where oxygen is utilized and to happen to 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 make that happen you need to have a balance between oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption and if that balance is not there and if the baby gets decompensated you have either increased oxygen consumption or sometimes normal oxygen consumption but decreased oxygen delivery and then the babies uh, get into shock the cells start getting hypoxic and start going into anaerobic metabolism and that is basically a stage of shock so and in cases like uh, uh, sepsis there is increased work of metabolism there is increased work and there is increased basal metabolism causing increase oxygen demand or the consumption which if it's not met the baby will go into shock now how oxygen delivery is de decided there there are few things we need to be having adequate for the oxygen delivery such as you have to have enough hemoglobin so if there is an anemia or hemorrhage you get hypovolemic shock because hemoglobin drops if your oxygen saturations are not good like if you have a lung disease or any shunts are playing causing mixing then also the baby will be hypoxic and will will end up getting into hypoxia and then shock if your cardiac output is not good enough because it's required you might not be anemic uh, you might well lungs might be normal but if you're if you're not able to perfuse the tissues your delivery will get affected and you will go into shock and what determines cardiac output you have to have enough heart rate you have to have enough fluid volume so preload you show you if you are dehydrated or hypovolemic you will not have enough cardiac output and then enough after load so you have to have a systemic vascular resistance or blood pressure to maintain the perfusion pressure and then good contractility good heart so heart should be beating enough all these things if they are okay and if there is a good svr maintaining the after load and blood pressure then the homeostasis is maintained or the perfusion is maintained so i hope that's clear so that's why we say uh, for any hemodynamic status assessment you need three things uh, which needs to be normal and these are the things which we can assess on the echo and that's nothing but your echo indices so one is having enough intravascular volume so what is the preload so you need to know what the preload is like what is the ivc feeling is like and if your preload is will be less in hypovolemic shock placental abruption sometimes with sepsis there is a uh, third spacing then the baby will be hypovolemic decrease preload uh, decrease svr then your heart needs to contract adequately so good rate and good contraction effect has to be there so baby is with hie cardiomyopathy metabolic condition or congenital heart blocks where the rate will be less and all other conditions previous three conditions will be the contractility will be less so if the pump is not functioning the blood coming is less the pump is not functioning very well and then third thing is your vasoreactivity which is your svr and the blood pressure which is needs to be maintained and it gets affected with sepsis nec or any any cause of systemic inflammatory response syndrome so echo parameters are just to assess what is the volume preload how is the heart rate function contractility and how is the blood pressure or the svr that's all we need to look at for the echo so we know the etiologies of the shock depending on if the volume is less if the function is less or the vessel irregularity is less and uh, the other thing which sometimes confounds our interpretation in the babies uh, in the neonatal period uh, the shock is very difficult to interpret after the echo also because many babies are in the first week of life will have some shunts in place so even if you calculate cardiac output lvo rvo you still have to factor in what the pda is like what is the pfo like and dr ravi explained you the pda effects 
So PDA can be confounder. So uh, you need to understand what the PDA physiology is going on and then interpret the cardiac output uh, in, in these babies. So uh, so so even if your pre if your preload is affected, your systemic blood flow will be less. Uh, but you might have a PDA with uh, left right shunt shunting across the PFO or a PFO which is causing more contribution to the R RA and that's a blood going to the RV and then that's why RVO will be effect of systemic blood flow plus atrial shunt. And uh, the LV blood is mainly coming from the pulmonary blood flow PF, PBF but uh, whatever the blood comes to the LV not everything goes to the goes out of the LV, but some might, might some might just get shunt in presence of PDA and then it just recirculated into the lungs and back to the LA. So you might have a high LVO because of the PDA and not necessarily because of the warm shock. So again, you know, your interpretation might change and that's why uh, you need to do the full comprehensive echo to make an interpretation and write down all the parameters and which can we can discuss during the workshop and then make an interpretation about what's going on with the baby. So that's why LVO is effect of pulmonary blood flow and ductal shunt. And that's why uh, many times when you do a cardiac output, if you have PFO and PDA, then maybe you should look at RVO as a surrogate of the systemic blood flow. So if your RVO is affected uh, low, then probably your systemic blood flow also is low. And LVO might be surrogate of the pulmonary blood flow rather than the systemic blood flow because you think LVO is connected to the systemic circulation. So LVO is important, but in presence of the shunts, it might tell you high LVO might be because of the PDA. So echo assessment, uh, again, uh, yeah, we have published the CPG guidelines of shock, a uh, very detailed parameter, but it doesn't talk about the echo, but it talks about the certain challenges we face in managing the babies with shock, which starts from even including the definitions of shock, including definition of the hypotension. So normally, uh, everyone, uh, what is the criteria for the blood pressure? What blood pressure criteria you follow? Anyone? I think we. it's better we try to be interactive. Only few 10, 12, 14 people are there who's attending. Uh, so what definition for a 30 weaker, what blood pressure, uh, mean blood pressure you will accept? Please type in the chat box or, or speak up. So 30, 26 weaker. So uh, 26, uh, 23 weaker. <laughs> so, so MAP equal to gestation is a blanket cutoff. And are there any references for this? Well, no, really, not really. And uh, this is just a consensus-based uh, statement made by some of the neonatologists while they are spending some time in the bar. And uh, it is just like an experience-based observation. There are no actually studies talking about it, but it has become so routine that when we looked at the definition of shock, most of the studies were following this as a criteria for definition of the shock. And unfortunately, very difficult to find the normograms. And surprisingly, this also is very initial two, three days. This may be little less than gestational. Yes, Navneet. So I think Dr. Navneet is pointing very important point that in first two, three days, it might be little less as you might have observed. Uh, and then it changes. So we don't have to fix it on one number. This is what I was trying to talk about it. Before jumping onto the echo, you need to make an assessment whether baby is really in the shock or not. So... Surprisingly, the gestation equal to uh, to uh, mean is is uh, works true for many time many times, but for babies less than 72, 32 weeks, and for less than seventy two hours, there are germinal neutral network guidelines which needs to be followed, which I'll show in the next slide. But for more than thirty uh, babies more than seventy two hours, uh, you might be able to okay you might be okay to follow mean equal to gestational age. So here, so your answers of 26 and 30 weeks for more than 72 hours is probably correct. And uh, 
for babies with more than term gestation, so more than 37 weeks, you have to follow systolic and diastolic less than 15 percentile on the Zubro's normogram. For a 38 weeker or 40 weeker, 42 weeker, please don't follow 40 weeks or mean equal to gestation. But yes, less than 32 weeks, probably that you, you are right to follow that. And you need to have other characters as well. Capri feel more than three seconds, urine output less, lact high lactate, waste deficits, and core to peripheral difference. So then that constitute to a shock uh, definition. And these are the nomograms I was talking about for babies less than 732 weeks and less than 72 hours. And this is actually based on a large German neural network study. And here now 26 weeks, somebody said I would follow 26. But you can see, the mean is actually 24 and the lowest cutoff is around 21. So this baby, even if it goes to 22 or 23 in first 72 hours, you don't have to jump and do an echo or start ionotropes. I mean, you can do an echo uh, if you're doing a gentle echo, but you this baby might be in transition circulation, may not necessarily be hypertensive and in shock. So you have to look at the clinical parameter. If the gases are normal, the color is good, baby is passing urine, baby is otherwise active, don't treat the number is the message we are trying to give you in first 72 hours. So you can see this these nomograms, all the guidelines are there published already, so CPG guidelines. We can go back and see that. And but importantly is uh, to know the blood pressure. Uh, so yes, if the blood pressure is low, the first thing you want to see is, again, before jumping onto the echo, is looking at systolic, diastolic blood pressure. Then you know exactly what you're dealing with. Because if you have an issue with preload, already uh, on the blood pressure is telling you, then you go and on the echo and uh, on the heart and just directly try to look at what's the problem with the preload. So if you, if you have decreased systemic vascular resistance like septic shock, hypovolemia, or any, any kind of bleeding, you will have a decrease in the diastolic blood pressure. So if your diastolics are dropping, possibly it's because of two things. One is decreased preload. So if you have less volume, you're vasodilated, if you have a PDA, then you will have low diastolic. But sometimes with high afterload or decrease afterload, also the diastolic blood pressure will drop. So your SVR, warm shock, NEC, SIRS and PDA. So these are the causes of diastolic. So if your diastolics are dropping, you probably need, you have two things. Decrease preload. So you go on echo and look at the preload or decrease afterload. If everything else is okay, then maybe it's a SVR, vasodilatation, or it's maybe it's the PDA which is present. So that's how you interpret. If your systolics are low, then I will go on the echo and find out what the problem is. The first thing I will look at is the, uh, well, first thing I will look at is the contactility actually. And second will be the afterload. So what sudden increase in the afterload will cause shock? The babies with uh, uh, going into the yeah cold shock, very high SVR. Sometimes babies with post-ductal ligation. So suddenly after ligation, the LV goes into severe hyper afterload, systolic blood pressure drops and uh, uh, babies go into shock. High, high thick blood, polycythemia, hypothermia, PPHN, all these will cause increase afterload. Yeah, post-ligation cardiac syndrome. Yes, now that's correct. PLCS and decrease contractility. Then I will go and check the heart function. So if there's a myocardial comp uh, compromise, asphyxia, cardiomyopathy, all those things will cause decrease in the contractility and decrease in the systolic blood pressure. So even before starting the echo, you know the you know the you know the uh, what you are dealing with based on the clinical history and the uh, blood pressure and the echo in, uh, and the clinical indices. So coming to the parameters. So let's look at the intravascular volume. Okay, first parameter. So how do you assess that?
So, so then you start with the IVC views. Again, we will be showing all these views. Uh, basically, how to get the IVC view, and uh, basic, uh, you need a uh, your probe has to be at twelve o'clock. The pointer fa facing at twelve o'clock. So this is twelve o'clock, uh, which is facing uh, up. That's your pointer here, and then you try to slightly tilt towards the right side, and uh, you get a uh, this view. Okay. Uh, your IVC view and uh, with hepatic vein entering into it. And uh, as you can see here, you put color on, then you see the how the IVC feeling is. Now, in this particular view, uh, in the newborn period, you know, doing like the M mode, IVC contractility index, collapsibility index are not very accurate. Even if you, if you eyeball, now this this IVC looks adequately filled, or maybe even slightly on the congested side. Uh, and now this IVC looks a little bit dilated side, and it's not moving. So the IVC which is congested and not dilated, probably you are adequately filled, or sometimes there might be back pressure changes in the IVC because of the high frequency ventilation or something like that. And you can do Doppler also, and then you can look at how the Dopplers looks like. And uh, sometimes you have uh, some pick lines, etc. going into the IVC view, which you might be able to find. And uh, sometimes you might be able to see on some clots also. So, you know, when you are interrogating the preload IVC, you, you look at everything which is going on. Sometimes you have UVCs or pick lines entering, clots happening, all those things. But uh, just for eyeballing, even you just look at the normally filled uh, IVC where you will have some pulsation with the uh, with the respiratory motion. So you will see nicely pulsating IVC. That means it's probably adequately filled. Underfilled IVC will be collapsed. So very barely barely visible and collapse entirely on inspiration. Uh, and another overfilled IVC, which again we saw just now large and it will be very minimally pulsatile. So you will not see a lot of variation in the respiration. So very congested. So that's how even if you interpret IVC flow, preload is too much less underfilled or adequate. That's all. Now, the, the caveat is if the baby is ventilated, especially on the high frequency, they will have a high intrathoracic pressure and they will be tamponed to the venous return and that will may make the IVC appear very overfilled. Uh, so then you will have to look at the cardiac chamber, which might be underfilled because of the high intrathoracic pressure. So many times you might have to drop the map or sometimes you have to change to conventional to do this echo and then make an assessment. So again, you know, uh, extremes are easy. Too congested and too collapsed IVCs are easy. In between, you might have a tricky, tricky issue. The next thing is contractility. Okay. So next is going to the contractility of the heart. So how do you assess the contractility? So uh, for assessing the contractility, there are uh, functional echo parameters. Again, uh, we will demonstrate that uh, bedside. So you have a parasternal long axis or a short axis view. This particular view is a short axis view where you have a uh, LV and then you have a septum here. Septum is here. And then you have a RV on the top. And then the M mode is done across both the chambers. And then what you do is basically you compare your uh, left ventricular internal diameter in diastole which is the widest diameter which is this and then you compare the left ventricular internal diameter in systole LVIDS which is during the contraction so the diameter between this when you compare this change in the volume in systole and diastole you get a, a fraction shorting and ejection fraction so you get a fraction shortening. It, it tells you how much the heart is shortening during the uh, contraction. And uh, that is how it will tell you the uh, systolic function. So if you have a decrease uh, in, uh, if there's a systolic dysfunction, then your, this volume will, will be less. So you will see a less change. So as you can see here, it is very nicely contracting, but uh, in a less uh, less sort of dysfunction heart or a less moving heart, your septum will be like this, not much moving. And the diameter change will be less. So your fraction shortening will be less. So 
this is one way of doing it there are some caveats so sometime if there is a dyssynchrony so you this this septum is not moving well uh, along with the the internal uh, the lateral wall of the ventricle sometimes the measurements are not very accurate if your angle is not correct sometimes you will not get a accurate measurement so you have to do something called a simpson's biplane method which can be done in a, a four chamber view or a two chamber view uh, will not teach you two chamber in the basics view but four chamber view what you do is basically for left ventricle uh, uh, contractility you basically uh, focus and measure the diameter uh, the area sorry uh, like this uh, first in uh, in diastole and then you again do the same thing in systole so you can see the wider diameter which is almost this much compared to a smaller diameter which is this much and when you compare that and, and you will and then you divide by this same uh, 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 denominator which is the diastolic volume you get ejection fraction so this is just comparing the sort of area of lb in systole and diastole you get ejection fraction so normally 50 to 60 percent 65 percent or up to 70 percent you have ejection fraction if you have something less than 55 50 then your function is poor sometimes you have a very high 75 80 ejection fraction that means it's very hyperdynamic heart so that's how you can do it with the simpsons biplane method and uh, there are newer methods uh, also available i'll not talk about this uh, something called a speckle tracking and tissue doppler but for that you need additional three chamber view a two chamber view and then you basically combine all these uh, views to uh, uh, and then you have a four chamber view also and then you have a software which can actually track how the ventricles are moving so this is also very more accurate way of seeking the contractility so if it's nice red then if the ventricle is moving very nicely and uh, if it's moving less, especially in asphyxiated heart, HIE babies or cardiomyopathies, you will see segmental functional abnormalities. You will see some segments are moving less and then it computes a number and then it, it will tell you, you know, how the function is like. Okay. Then the next thing is uh, after contactality is how much is the cardiac output? So two things, both LVO and RVO you have to calculate. So left ventricle output uh, for any calculating of the output, you need two parameters. One is the diameter and second is the velocity or the, how much is the blood ejecting out in that uh, uh, in that vessel. So for the left ventricle output, to one first is the aortic diameter, which you can find in the parasternal long axis view. And this is the, you can zoom this, then you'll get this picture and you just mark the hinge points and measure the left ventricle output diameter. So first measure the diameter. The next thing you need is a five chamber view which is the LVOT of uh, uh, outflow. And then you put a, a sort of a pulse wave Doppler here. And then you get this kind of a waveform, which is uh, on the pulse wave Doppler. So you have to do pulse wave Doppler, not continuous wave Doppler, so that it measures the velocity across at the level of valve, because you are trying to measure at the level of valve. So you have diameter and you have a velocity at the level of valve. And you get this wave where you do area under curve and then you get a value called as VTI, velocity time integral. And that's your uh, kind of an amount of the area. The area under curve tells you how much is the blood getting ejected in each, each beat. So you apply the formula, uh, the VTI uh, and into the diameter that will give you a stroke volume. So that's a volume, stroke volume in each beat. So to calculate the cardiac output, uh, sorry, some uh, issue with the slides. So to calculate the cardiac output, basically you apply the formula uh, stroke volume times heart rate because this was per bit. You multiply that by heart rate and then divide it by birth weight. Okay. This is the one. So birth weight is here. Okay. And that will give you left ventricle output in terms of meals per kg per minute. Easy. So that's how LVO is calculated. Similarly, uh, and the LV validation uh, has been done already. Like, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, if it's accurately done, it can actually give you a good train and it correlates with even MRI. So I will not go much into the details about it. 
but uh, rvo is also similarly can be done you need two two parameters one is the uh, pulmonary artery diameter or a right ventricle output uh, right ventricle outflow diameter rvo diameter which is done in the parasternal long axis view uh, the pulmonary outflow view so basically and uh, then you put a uh, doppler across the valve a pulse rate doppler and then you get a area under curve which is your pulmonary vti and once you have the VTI, same formula you apply, stroke volume times heart rate divided by birth weight, and you get a right ventricular output. Now, sometimes if you don't have time, you can rush, you can just do like a MPA or pulmonary artery uh, uh, eyeballing VTI, and you can see this is so low, say, uh, say maybe this is so low, and this is so high. So even if you just compare the VTI, you know that this baby is in trouble. It's got a very low cardiac output, low RVO. And this baby is probably okay. So just uh, uh, velocity in the MP also gives you a lot of ideas. And uh, pulmonary artery velocity max more than 0.45 meter per second. Uh, uh, generally we expect. And uh, uh, then you, you know that the blood pressure, uh, the blood flow is adequate. And if it's less than 0.35, then there will be probably low systemic blood flow. So, and between 0.3 to 5, 2.45 is a gray zone. You have to watch and monitor these babies. So, just looking at the VTI, and we, we saw in the previous slide that uh, the how in presence of PFO and PDA, RVO is an important surrogate of the systemic blood flow. I think I have about five, almost five more minutes. So, uh, coming to the, uh, so, when, so now uh, looking at the echo in the shock, uh, so your SVR is a calculated value. So now you need to know what you're dealing with. So uh, you can know the stage of the shock by measuring the cardiac output, looking at the contractility and then looking at the blood pressure. So indirectly you're looking at the systemic vascular resistance. So uh, in a normal status, which is the green, you have a normal blood pressure, normal cardiac output. So no worries. In a B where you have a low cardiac output, uh, but blood pressure is high so this baby is compensated and we saw this can happen uh, with a uh, baby with cardiogenic shock or hypoallemic shock where they have high svr and their compensated blood pressure might be normal okay then you have c where both are abnormal so this is a very dangerous uh, uh, square where both Cardiac output is low and blood pressure is low. So the, all the measure, methods of decompensation compensation have failed and baby is decompensated. And sometimes you have a high cardiac output like this phase, normal or high cardiac output, but still the blood pressure is low. And that's kind of a hyperdynamic circulation like PDA. PDA will have a high cardiac output, but blood pressure might be low. If you measure the LVO, it will be 400, 500 but the blood pressure might be low because there's a low diastolic. So this is the interpretation of the blood pressure, echo indices, and uh, you know the clinical situations and based on what you can understand. So I think that's uh, that sums up uh, just some examples of decreased LVO. Uh, uh, this was viral myocarditis. The LVO was very low. You can see LVO was around, I think, 70 or 80 something. Your baby was acidotic. And there's an ejection fraction. The fraction shortening normally is around 30 to 40 percent. Here it was only 18 percent. So it's a viral myocarditis. And uh, this is a baby with decreased RVO, uh, 23 weaker, only 550 gram, and then uh, worsening of the lung. The RV failed. You can see RV is so dilated, and it failed. Even here you can see RV is massively dilated. Even the septum is like here. You are hardly able to see the LV. So, so your RVO is very low. So, you know that this RV is failed and the systemic uh, perfusion also is poor. So, this is the baby, same. You can see the RVO VTA is only 2, 2.2. So, normally it is around 10 to 12. So, very, very poor function. And PPH and I'll skip. Uh, and PDA, you can have a high LVO. We spoke about that. And uh, again, uh, important, very high LVO. In, if no PDA and no evidence of pH, it could be sepsis. Okay, so high LVO could be sign of warm shock. And uh, 
SVC flow, I'll skip because we are not doing nowadays a lot. SVC flow, although it's important in the shock, but uh, because SVC flow is uh, mainly in the premature babies, uh, it gives you cardiac output, which is independent of the circulatory shunts. So it tells you the, how much is the cardiac output uh, in the upper part of the body, importantly the brain. So generally it's between 30 to 50%. And if it is below 30%, then uh, it's abnormal. Maybe we'll try to demonstrate that uh, during the echo workshop. I'll skip this here. And uh, yeah, there is just few more things to uh, show is uh, uh, when you're doing the echo shock assessment, don't forget to do the uh, the parasitic short axis view. Uh, Sometimes everything looks okay, but there is a big pericardial effusion sitting here. And you know, uh, so always try to do the full echo assessment. Don't miss the fluid because that can cause the compromise and you might be searching for other cause and there's a pericardial effusion sitting there. So that is also very important. And uh, this bolus is things I will skip. And uh, I think I'll stop here. There is uh, the choice of inotropes and all I wanted to cover. Maybe I'll just show one, two more scenario. Do I have one or two minutes? Any questions are coming? Share PPT. Yes, audio lost. Oh, got it again. Bill. And no audio. Okay. This is again the cardiac dysfunction, moderate to severe HIE. And uh, you can see the blood pressure is low here. And uh, so basically when the blood pressure is low, so this this case I wanted to highlight is uh, the PPHN, uh, the, the shock doesn't come in isolation. So you have a P HIE with PPH and with sepsis. So you don't know what is the predominant component. So you need an echo assessment to know if the PPH is affecting this baby's oxygenation or is it the cardiac contractility which is low or is it the sepsis? So is it the problem with the SVR? If the SVR is low, then you will give dopamine or norepinephrine. But if your function cardiac contractility is low, you will give dobutamine or epinephrine. So that's why echo is very important. And this baby had a on echo, there was a decreased fractional shortening and ejection fraction. LVO was low. So your choice of inotrope will be dobutamine or epinephrine. Instead of that, suppose you start dopamine or norepinephrine, your cardiac function will hamper further. So these are the salient thing you want to talk about. Same thing, this is a baby with CMV. And uh, you can see the contractility is very poor. Repeated clepsial infection and this baby developed like a poor contractility and cardiomyopathy. You see the ejection fraction is only 28%. Fraction shortening is only 12%. So again, they thought baby is in sepsis because there was repeated clepsial infection. Now, if you give norepinephrine or dopamine to this baby blindly, you will kill the baby because if you have a failing heart and you suddenly increase the SVR, the, the heart will fail. So that's why eco monitoring is very important. I think I'll stop here and take the questions. So this is just the take home, but the, I think we covered uh, the mainly the idea of the this lecture was to cover and make an understanding of the shock. So understand preload, IVC, uh, and then look at the contactility, ejection fraction, fraction shortening, maybe speckle tracking, tissue dopplers, all those things, eyeballing the contactility, and then after load you look at the SVR, blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, and then make a combination of. Uh, all these things in interpretation, but also rule out PD and PPHN because they, they can come as a compounder uh, and, and change your picture. So that's that's all about shock and happy to take any questions. I guess no questions, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. We can discuss certain things in the Echo workshop day after tomorrow. Yes, sir. Yeah. On Friday, sir, 27th. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, you covered everything very well and in detail. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Uh, for the next class, I will welcome Dr. Kunalaya, sir. Sir, are you there? Sir, am I audible? Yeah. 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 Am I audible clearly? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, welcome, sir.
sir uh, has done his md pediatric and fellowship in neurology he was a uh, uh, author for uh, many chapters in various books and edited two neurotal books also and had many international and national articles and paper presentations uh, he was executive committee member nnf gujarat academy of pediatric and im rajkot he was editor in chief neo bliss uh, 2022 to 2022 uh he will be elected as secretary gujarat state nnf 24 uh, 2024 to 2025 he will be president elect aop rajkot in uh, uh, 2026 to 2027 uh sir will take a class on normal anatomies and uh, views in head ultrasound welcome sir over to you sir thank you for your kind introduction just one correction i am presently secretary so i think you my mistake oh, okay, about sir. my previous sir this it was introduction no issues no 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 issues no issues no, no issues at all yeah yes, thank you so much for your kind introduction and thank you thank the you, uh, for giving me this opportunity to present uh, before this wonderful audience yes sir. so uh, today i will be talking about the normal anatomy and the views in the head head ultrasound uh so basically what is an ultrasound it is the name given to the frequency which are beyond the human hearing so we usually do not hear any sound while we are doing an ultrasound but it is the beam which passes through the body tissues and we can get the images from it so usually it is uh, measured in the frequency of 2 to 10 megahertz so from this figure you can uh, see that uh, human hearing is between 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz but ultrasound is between 2 to 10 megahertz so usually we do not hear any sound while doing the ultrasound but it is basically the higher frequency sounds which passes through the tissue and we can get a clearer image so from this uh, you can see that uh, there is a radar is there which is uh, throwing a frequency from which uh, the waves which are initially colliding with the desired structure or the fish in this case getting the waves if earlier than those the structures which are behind so based on this how early we get the waves reflected back to the transducer we get the image which is uh, which part is nearer and which part is further away from the probe so basically there are two main components of the ultrasound unit this has been already been covered but just to brush up because there are slight differences <clears throat> in while we are doing an echocardiography against that while we are doing a usg brain so when we'll over right right now we are discussing is that we are discussing about the ultrasound of the brain so here the transducers which we are using are between 5 to 10 megahertz is the ideal transducer which we use most circumstances 7.5 is the uh, adequate frequency which we use but in extremely premature babies you need a <coughs> you need to see a more superficial structure so you need a higher frequency more higher frequency probe while in a full term or a baby with thick head and you need to use the deeper structures you use a, a lower frequency probe in uh, nowadays you can set the frequencies so the probes which are coming are showing you in uh, ranges also so it can be from 7 to 15 5 to 10 different frequency ranges are there based on that you can select so usually we do not uh, Uh, since the probes are very costly we do not uh, usually buy multiple probes but the neonatal echocardiography probe is sufficient to see the uh, usg brain also so because it has a narrower footprint which can easily sit on the uh, anterior front tunnel and we can see the uh, all of the brain through it or but what you need to make sure is that you select a neonatal head ultrasound probe because it is of a higher higher frequency while a pediatric echocardiography probe is of a more lower frequency so you need to have a more higher frequency probes in in your nic so there are different kinds of probes that is sectoral linear curvy linear and radial what we commonly use is a sectoral probe you can even use a linear probe for a more superficial structures and <clears throat> sometimes when you are in a crisis this radial probe is the transvaginal probe that can also be used and gives a very crisp and clear images so on the probe you see the markers so what you had uh, learned from the mohit sani sir's lecture is that you imagine a clock and based on the uh, the timing you decide whether it is 11 o'clock 12 o'clock or 3 o'clock position but in the head ultrasound you usually keep it on either on the right side while on the echocardiography we keep it on the left side here on we keep it on the right side 
or either anterior. These are the commonest two positions where we keep our marker. And you have learned from Mohit Sani sir's lecture, there are a few movements are there. That is tilting, angulation and rotation. These are the commonest. So, in relation to the footprint, if we move the tail end in front or back, it is called tilting. If we move the tail end from right to left, it is called as angulation. And if we rotate it completely, then it is called as rotation. So, how do you hold the probe? Here, if for holding the probe, your marker should be on the right side of the head or it should be anterior and you should be safely securing your hands because while doing the ultrasound, sometimes the baby moves so or your hand would be moving a lot. So, you should try to secure your hand. So, how do you do it? You hold your probe like a pen and with the thumb and index finger and the rest of the three fingers should be rested on the baby and not much pressure should be given because the baby will get irritated and if the baby is critical, you might there will be this desaturation also. If that is happening, then you, to, you need to stop your review, keep on practicing how to hold the probe <clears throat> and once you get clear, better images, when you seek, able to securely hold your probe. Now for doing head ultrasound, you need to select your preset, which again Dr. Kamal Sir had excellently explained in the live demonstration that <clears throat> there are various presets are there in which you need to select the head ultrasound preset so that you get a better image, the right and left orientation marker, the gains, the depth, all those are already being set. So that you get an image, you need not set the gains and the brightness or the depth or zooming. All those needs not to be set every time. That has to be already being set by the uh, ultrasound company application specialist to make sure that if you are doing your head ultrasound, your machine has a neonatal brain ultrasound preset already there on your machine. So now coming to the indications. So in which babies do we need to do the head ultrasound? So all those premature babies, we need to do a screening head ultrasound because we are not sure or sometimes it's Clinically, we cannot make the judgment whether the baby is getting intraventricular hemorrhage or not. So, we need, need to screen. So, when and how to screen, I will be telling you in the next slides. Then, in all the sick preterm babies, because the uh, baby might get, might get sick because of the intraventricular hemorrhage, if there is sudden fall in hemoglobin, there can be intraventricular hemorrhage. If there is a large or rapidly enlarging head for evaluation of microcephaly, if you are suspecting meningitis or ventriculitis, you need to see whether there is hydrocephalus is developing or not. If there are any intracranial hemorrhages, even in babies with post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, you need to monitor whether the hydrocephalus is increasing or not. So, clinically, you measure the head circumference, but ultrasonography, you can measure the ventricular index, which Dr. Vishal will be describing. So, uh, you need to uh, measure those parameters so that you can uh, decide whether you need to intervene in those babies or not. In the babies of neonatal seizures, in babies of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, also you need to be, do an head ultrasound uh, to see uh, to uh, see for the neuroprognostic markers like RI in any traumatic or difficult deliveries in sick infants, irrespective of their gestational age, if there is a large boggy swelling. Or if there is any unexplained congestive cardiac failure, a few months back I had a baby which was presented with heart failure and PPHN and when I put the probe on the head, it was a vein of Galen malformation. That is an AV malformation. So, it can that can also help in diagnosis such rare conditions also. So, now which baby should be screened? So, there previously was the indications in which we need to do it, but sometimes we need to do routine screening also. So, any baby who is below 1.5 kg or below 32 weeks or any baby who is above 32 weeks or above 1.5 kg, if there is history of perinatal asphyxia, if there is benzene pneumothorax, abnormal neurological signs and in all the ventilators babies, we need to do screening for any intracranial pathologies. So, when and how to screen? So, we screen in all the babies below 28 weeks, 1 kg at 6 hours of age because there can be sometimes antenatal intraventricular hemorrhage also. It has a medical legal implications. We routinely do it between 3 weeks, 3 days after birth to between 1 week at 4 weeks and at the time of discharge or term equivalent age, whichever is earlier. Any baby who is between 28 to 32 weeks or between 1 to 1.5 kg between day 3 to 1 week, 4 weeks and a term gestation and any baby who is above 32 weeks 
n has any complication we do it between 5 day to 1 week of age so now the practical aspects this was the theory when you do it how you do it how you hold the probe but now how we actually do the head ultrasound so as you have uh, heard from uh, Dr. Sujit Madam's lecture that there is bone is a very bad conductor. It absorbs all the ultrasound waves and it doesn't reflect back. So you will not be able to see any structure which is behind the or below the bony structure. So you need to find out some sonic windows that is the membranous parts through which the ultrasound waves can pass easily. So what are the structures which we see in the neonatal period is one is the antenatal anterior front tunnel posterior front tunnel, the mastoid front tunnel or the spinoid front tunnel. So, anterior front tunnel is the commonest site or location through which we do the head ultrasound and sometimes or rarely we use posterior or any other front tunnels. So, we won't be discussing much about the other front tunnels but mainly we will be doing head ultrasound through the anterior front tunnel only. So, basically what we will be seeing is brain is basically a three-dimensional structure but we will be viewing it in a, in a two-dimensional structure and anterior frontal is the standard acoustic window. So, as Mohit Sani Sar has excellently demonstrated that we will be cut opening the, uh, the structure what we are seeing like in heart it is like we are cutting open the heart. Similarly, in the brain also so the wave passes in a single plane so like we will be cutting that part and we will be able to see. Actually not we are cutting but the sound waves are passing through a single plane and it gets reflected back and whatever structures are coming in between uh, the uh, that plane, those structures will be seen on your screen. So how do you scan? So brain is scanned from the frontal to the occipital area that is from anterior to posterior and in the sagittal plane from right to the left. So, your finding should be recorded in at least 6 standard coronal and 5 standard parasagittal planes. And if you find any abnormality, it should be recorded in at least 2 planes. Because there can be some anatomical variation which you might misjudge as pathology. So, you need to record it at, in at least 2 planes. So, remember this. From front to back and from right to left. So, basically there are 6 coronal and 5 sagittal planes which I will be talking in detail. So, if the transducer beam is placed on the true coronal or sagittal planes, that is exactly in the midline also, still there is some asymmetry which is physiological. So, you need to angulate it a bit so that you get a better and a symmetrical image. So, now again to the probe marker which I told you that it has to be kept on the right side for your coronal views and anteriorly for your sagittal views. And your marker on the screen should always be on the left side. That means that this marker is kept on the right side of the baby. And the marker which you see on the screen should always be on the left side of the screen. So, now the coronal views. So, there are six standard coronal views. We will be talking about them one by one. So, first is the through the frontal cortex so you can see this you will be able to see all the structures when you are tilting the probe anteriorly so this is how you move your probe so this is from the anterior going all the way to the posterior so this is how your beams pass and you will get you will be able to see the structures so here you keep your probe in the anterior front tunnel and you will be sweeping it from anterior to the posterior part and one by one you will be recording all the images. Again, when actually on the brain, again it will pass like this only from anterior. You move your probe more posteriorly and it goes from the frontal to the occipital lobes. So, when you keep your probe with the marker on the right side on the anterior front tunnel and you tilt the probe anteriorly, you will be your beams will be passing through the frontal cortex and these are the structures which you will identify so what are these structures so there will be a bright hyper intense line from going in the central part that is the interhemispheric fissure on the side of it you will be seeing the frontal lobe and below that you can see identify the structure that are the eyes or the orbit and so it is the orbital ridge Okay, so you will be seeing three major structures when you are sweeping your probe anteriorly that is the interhemispheric fissure, the frontal lobe and the orbital ridge. 
now when you move your beam more posteriorly you tilt your probe more posteriorly these are the structures which will come in the way of your ultrasound beams and we call it the coronal view through the frontal horns so these are the frontal horns of the lateral ventricle lateral ventricle has multiple horns which dr vishal will be talking in detail but here will what it is passing through is the frontal horn so this is the frontal cortex and the lateral ventricles which are coming in contact with the frontal horns are the frontal uh, fr uh, frontal lobe are the frontal horns so like this the beams are cutting open the brain and these are the structures you will be able to see so what are the structures again the bright structure here is the interhemispheric fissure below that you see the there is a two lines are parallel running lines are there which is called the corpus callosum it is an important finding you need to see it from anterior to posterior part because there can be sometimes anomalies like corpus callosal hygienesis so you need to identify two parallel lines below that is your frontal horn of the lateral ventricle this uh, hypodense area is the cavum septum pellucidum which is an empty space between the two layers of the fox cerebri it is called as the cavum septum pellucidum below that is the caudate nucleus here also in the, the diagrammatic depiction you can see that this is the caudate nucleus and below that is the putamen so these are few important structures you need to identify while doing your head ultrasound few more structures are this is the frontal horn then you will see a y-shaped uh, line see here you can see it a y-shaped structure is there which is called as the sylvian feature fissure which is a uh, fissure which separates the frontal horn from the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe and below is your temporal lobe so this is your sylvian fissure below is your temporal lobe this is the temporal lobe and this is your frontal lobe okay so these are the structures you need to identify while doing your head ultrasound. Now, the third coronal view, that is the view which is called as the view passing through the foramen of Monroe. This is also in Indian context, we call it the Trishul view. Like we see that there are three wings are we can see. So it is also called as the Trishul view or the coronal view through the foramen of Monroe. So here, Again, the beam is cutting and the beams are passing through all these structures. So, one by one, we will see. So, when we cut open this structure, so you can identify the image like this. And when we see it against the uh, actual image, so these are the lateral ventricles. Okay. Then the lateral ventricles are connected to the third ventricle and that structure which is connecting, or the, it is called as the foramen of Monroe. And below the foramen of Monroe is the third ventricle. So, lateral ventricles are connected to the third ventricle and then again it will go to the fourth ventricle. So, here this is a very important structure. You need to identify this. This is a threshold view. Okay. So, if here in the threshold view, you need to see for the uh, st uh, structure. So, again, what all other structures are there? This is the interhemispheric fissure. Now, here you can appreciate the double line or the uh, rail track. Uh, like pattern is there it is the corpus callosum then below the lateral ventricle is your caudate nucleus then you can see in, if you try to remember the theory there is an internal capsule that is the uh, less than or is this side greater than sign like structure is there and in between the internal capsules all the fibers from the motor cortex passes through this structure and in between that is our putamen and let Medially is the global pellet, pellet, uh, pellidus. Okay, so these are the structures which you identify while do you keep your probe passing through the foramen of Monroe. Now the fourth view is the coronal view through the middle ventricle. Okay, so this is how the beam passes, and when you see these structures, these are the structures which you are able to see. So Again, what is this structure? If anybody can write in the chest box, what is this right hyperechoic structure, vertical line which is going through? Anyone can answer in the chat box? Okay.
structure. See, this hyperechoic structure is the interhemispheric fissure. Below this hypoechoic area is your cavum septum pellucid. Okay. So, again, this hypoechoic structure laterally are the lateral ventricles. And this is a very important structure because from uh, view because from this point your choroid plexus starts. We will see in the lateral uh, uh, sagittal views also to be able to easily identify the choroid plexus. So from this point onwards your choroid plexus starts. Then below is your third ventricle and on the lower side you get your cerebellum. So this is the structure. So this view is very important for in the point through which your choroid plexus starts. Now, when we go more posteriorly, that is the fifth view, that is through the posterior horns of the lateral ventricle. So, lateral ventricles, this is the choroid plexus and your cerebellum. So, these are the structures you see. So, even you need to see all these structures. Why? Because sometimes in the lateral part of the ventricle, you can see there is an intraventricular hemorrhage grade 4 or you see the pairs, changes of the PVL also. So, you need to scan from anterior to posterior. So, you do not miss any area. So, now we will be moving from the coronal views to the sagittal views. Okay. So, in sagittal view, you need to rotate your probe and you need to keep your marker anteriorly that is facing towards the nose. So, this is how you see from the front and from the lateral sides. You see this the ridge is there and a light, light is there. So, this is the marker is pointing towards the nose of the baby. So, there are three basic views. So, one is more central and two lateral views. So, two and two on both the sides. So, total five views are there. So, first view, second view, third view, fourth and the fifth view. Okay. So, this is how you rotate your probe with your marker pointing anteriorly. Okay. So, when the beams cut open the brain like this, these are the structures which you can identify. Okay. So, how do you know whether you are in the actual center or the exact midline? You identify it by this sign which is called as the lady in dress appearance. So, here you can see like this is an English lady wearing a big gown. So, it is called as the lady in dress sign. So, the, here you can see the similarly, this is the head part, this is the shoulder part, the body and this is the big gown. So, this is the lady in dress sign. So, if you see this, you know that you are exactly in the center or the midline. Okay. So, what are the structures you identify here is the, the this is the again two parallel lines that is the corpus callosum. So, if there is a partial agenesis, sometimes posterior part you are not able to see easily. An anterior part or the part of the genu is you can see it very easily. So, this is the corpus callosum. Second is the cavum septum pellucidum. Here you can see the foramen of Monroe. And here is your third ventricle. Okay. And this is your part of the cerebellum. Okay. So, these are the structures you identify in the true sagittal view uh, in the midline. Okay. So, now uh, as I told, third ventricle, below that is your fourth ventricle and anterior to that is your brainstem. So, these are all the structures you get to see in the in this. Okay. So, now if we move the probe more laterally, as you can see, we have tilted the probe laterally use as a uh, uniform for the uniformity. You do it on the right side first and then on the left side. You tilt the probe and when you cut open the brain, you see all these structures. So, one by one, we will see that this is the caudate nucleus, this is the caudothalamic groove and this is the thalamus. So, in the groove in between the caudate nucleus and the thalamus is called as the caudothalamic groove or the caudothalamic notch. Why is it important? Because choroid plexus starts from the caudothalamic groove. So, it is the in the coronal plane, when it passes through the mid middle ventricle part of the ventricle, you see the, vent the choroid plexus. Anterior to that, you don't see the choroid plexus. So, if there is an intraventricular hemorrhage, there is an extension of the hyperechoic dense area, which is which will cross the caudothalamic groove. So, if there is an in the lateral, if you are sometimes confused whether there is a grade 1 IVH or not, 
then you will have to identify the chordothalamic groove and if there is an hyperechoic structure or you see that the choroid plexus is extending beyond the chordothalamic groove then you would label it as grade 1 IVH okay so this is the importance of the chordothalamic groove then this is the choroid plexus which starts from the chordothalamic groove and goes posteriorly in the occipital area and even in the temporal lobes and this is the inferior horn of lateral ventricles so frontal horn middle horn occipital horn and the inferior horn okay now, when you move it more laterally, so this is the third sagittal view. So, here you are tilting the probe more laterally. So, here the structure which opens up, you will try to see. So, here you will see the all of the cerebral cortex. So, we will have to identify the lobes. So, in the interior part is the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, more posterior is the occipital lobe. Here is the sylvian fissure which we had seen as the Y-shaped structure in the initial scans. Above that is your frontal lobe. Below that is your temporal lobe. Okay, so this is useful for identifying your periventricular leukomalacia. So all these views are important. All these views have some of the other significance, and as well as sometimes there is localized lesions are there. So you should not be missing any parts. So all six frontal to occipital and this coronal view, and from the middle to the uh, both the sides in the sagittal view on either side that is left and right both sides you should be screening. So now these are the posterior views I won't go into the much of the detail but here you keep your marker on the right side and you keep the probe on the posterior this thing and this is how the brain part opens and you will be able to see the structures like in the anterior interhemispheric fissure, occipital lobe, lateral ventricle and the third ventricle. Okay, so sometimes when you don't get a clearer picture on the entire front tunnel, you can see for the third ventricle or the more or posterior areas, occipital areas to the posterior. Other is the mastoid view. So here you keep your marker anteriorly and it is just behind the ear. So this is how you keep your probe. Okay, and you, you will be able to see the cerebellum. So this is the cerebral uh, hemisphere. This is the cerebral vermis. In front of that is the fourth ventricle and your brainstem. So sometimes cerebellar hemorrhages are also there. You can use this view to identify that. Next, what is important is the cerebral artery Doppler. So we see for mainly two arteries that is the anterior cerebral artery Doppler and the middle cerebral artery Doppler. Sorry that I am rushing through it, but I need to cover all the aspects. So for the anterior cerebral artery Doppler, we select the true sagittal plane that is we keep it on the anterior front tunnel with marker pointing towards the nose of the baby. So this is how you rotate the probe and the marker here is pointing towards the nose of the baby, anterior part of the brain. So when it cut opens the brain, you will be able to identify that this is the whole of this is the anterior cerebral artery and you have to take a pulse wave Doppler on this part, I'll be showing you how do you take it also. So when you keep, you take a true sagittal, you might need to tilt it a bit laterally to get this whole of the anterior cerebral artery. So you tilt it slightly laterally and then this is, and when you put your color flow over here, you'll be able to identify the anterior cerebral artery, which is coming from below and crossing the corpus callosum and then going above. So here you need to keep the frequency on the lower side, color scales on the lower side because it is a very low flow, uh, low velocity blood flow. So this is how you will be able to see a pulsatile artery that is the anterior cerebral artery when you keep your color flow. Then how do you measure it? First you need to identify the anterior cerebral artery. Then you need to keep your pulse wave Doppler gate over here. So again I am telling you true sagittal view. Try to identify a pulsatile structure, keep your color flow gate over here and then you keep your pulse wave Doppler and then you press your pulse wave Doppler again so you will be able to see. So again, uh, put your color flow, identify the pulsatile anterior cerebral artery, then you keep your, you can see the faint marking that the pulse wave Doppler gate is there and then you again press it so you will be able to identify, you will be able to get such images that is the uh, your anterior cerebral artery Doppler flows. So after that, what you do is you measure the peak systolic and the end diastolic and your machine will automatically calculate the RI 
So normally the R I is of between 0.55 to 0.8 or 0.85. If anything above or below it is abnormal. So it helps in prognosticating the neurodevelopmental outcome, though not hundred percent, but it gives you an indirect evidence. So in babies who are babies with birth asphyxia, you can monitor the R I's as well as in babies with hydrocephalus also. And second, what we monitor is the middle cerebral artery. So we move the probe on the sphenoidal fontanel. So how do you do it? You split the probe, take the probe. It is slightly in front and above the ear. Here is the sphenoid fontanel. You need to maneuver it a bit and you keep the marker anteriorly towards the probe. So here how you do it. You keep your marker anteriorly and this cut opens the brain like this. And this is the middle cerebral artery, what you see. These are the middle cerebral arteries. Okay, so this is how you get to see the middle cerebral artery over here. Okay, again, same thing. You keep your pulse wave Doppler gate over here and then you get the waveforms and you will have to measure. So here you can see in the 2D also some pulsatile structure is there. You put the color flow, then you put your pulse wave gate over here and again you press the pulse wave button and you will be able to see this waveform. Again, you see for the peak systolic and the end diastolic and measure the RI in these structures. So this is a table in which you can see that the RI is increased in intracranial bead, in PVL, in cerebral hemorrhage, hydrocephalus, while it is decreased in some of the conditions like your HIV. Okay. So I think I have finished on time. So, if there are any other questions are there, they are most welcome. And if I have five minutes, I can ask questions also. Uh, yes, sir, there is one question. Uh, yes, there is one question in chat box. Can you repeat the CTG importance? Sorry, repeat the importance of? CTG. Someone has written CTG importance. Please repeat, sir. Oh, no. CTG. CTG. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, so, you have to take the image on the sagittal view. So, first you need to identify the true sagittal view. Then you have to move it laterally. Okay. So, that is the second view. Here you need to identify the structures that is the caudate nucleus and the thalamus and you will identify a groove or a notch is there that is called as the caudothalamic notch. In the caudothalamic notch behind the or posterior to the caudothalamic notch the choroid plexus starts. If the choroid plexus if you see hyperechoic area crossing the caudothalamic groove then you need to suspect for the grade 1 intraventricular hemorrhage because sometimes there is a confusion that when you are looking at the coronal views in the view of the foramen of Monroe, usually you do not see the choroid uh, plexus. But if you see an hyperechoic dot-like structure over there, then there are chances that, that the child is having an intraventricular hemorrhage. To confirm it, as I had mentioned previously, that if you are suspecting any lesion, need to confirm it in at least two of the planes. So, in the second plane is your sagittal plane. In the sagittal plane, when you see that the hyperechoic area, this hyperechoic area, that is the choroid plexus, is crossing the caudothalamic groove, then you suspect that the, the child is having an intraventricular hemorrhage. Different grading, I think, will be covered by Dr. Vishal. But for there is usually confusion between a normal uh, choroid plexus or the germinal matrix hemorrhage that is the grade 1 IVH. In that case, you have to identify the caudothalamic groove. If the choroid plexus is going anterior or the hyperechoic area is crossing the caudothalamic groove, then you suspect that the baby is having intraventricular, grade 1 intraventricular hemorrhage. So, you need this is a very important uh, um, point or the right for deciding whether the baby is actually having a hyperechoic or uh, this uh, grade 1 IVH or not. There are different parameters are also there like there is a it is more hyperechoic is equivalent to your bony structure whether <coughs> there is an irregular margin or not but this is one of the pointers which will help in identifying whether the baby is having intraventricular hemorrhage or not. So this is the importance of identifying the 
chordothalamic groove whether the choroid plexus is crossing it or not. Yeah, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. One question, normal value of uh, RI. It's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Then, sir, can you repeat uh, periventricular leukomalacia? So, perivent <clears throat> so, basically, it is uh, periventricular leukomalacia is the uh, in the babies who are preterm usually you see or sometimes in the very severe hypoxic babies who are in full term babies also you see the periventricular leukomalacia so usually you see it on the lateral plane so whenever you are seeing in the coronal plane if you see in the initial days you see an hyperechoic area on the or a periventricular flare that is the hyperdense area extending beyond the lateral ventricles in the coronal view like a fan shaped structure, then you suspect that this my baby might develop a later on periventricular. That is the empty spaces or the small cyst like areas. Again, there is a, a uh, it is not so easy to describe, but there are microcystic, macrocystic areas. You cannot be, see microcystic areas, but in macrocystic areas, you can see in the USG. So, initially in the first week, you see the flare, and later on when you do it, you can see that there are some cystic areas are developing. Those are called as the periventricular leukomalacia. It can be various grades, whether it is just limited to the periventricular area extending up to the uh, white matter or even completely covering the brain. So those it is for so you for that you need to identify. You need to see on the uh, coronal views at the periventricular areas as well as you need to see on the sagittal views more on the lateral plane also. So, you need to see for the extent how far it is going and based on that you can grade the periventricular leukomalacia. Okay. Any other questions? No, sir. No questions. Okay. Thank you, I sir. You can, yeah, thank, thank you so much. I think I have finished on time. I, I was a bit fast, but I need to cover all the aspects so that it would be easy, easier for Dr. Vishal to cover other aspects. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move further for the next talk. Uh, it will take Dr. Vishal Gohil sir is uh, taking the next class. Uh, small introduction of sir. Uh, yes. Sir has uh, done his fellowship in neurotology. Uh, also fellowship in neurotology uh, from Royal College of Pediatric and Child Health UK. He was visiting a fellow in neurotal ECMO UK. Uh, he uh, he is trainer he is tra <clears throat> trainer advanced and basic NRP shine program uh, trainer in hemodynamics head ultrasound lung, lung ultrasound and also USG guided vascular access uh, he was uh, has special interest in neonatal ventilation and hemodynamics focus and uh, quality improvement in NICU the sir is now working as a consultant neonatologist at uh, Arpan Newborn Care Center Ahmedabad. Uh, sir will take a, a class on identification and measurement uh, in IVH and hydrocephalus. Uh, welcome, sir. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Vilas, to give the kind in, uh, introduction. Thank and you, sir. Before, before I start the session, I would like to thank uh, Mohit, sir, Prasant, sir, and all the organizing committee from Vedzo Neocon to inviting us for this session. Before I jump into the main topic, when you do the you know, any any head ultrasound or any other echo, first you need to look for that, does it normal or not? Don't directly jump on the pathology, okay? So once you feel that that is a normal, then that is a like separate thing. But if it is not normal, then you need to look for the, which are the abnormality you are looking, okay? So it comes with the practice. So when you start the head ultrasound or whichever the echo or something else, Try to look for the normal thing first of all, and then you can once you repeat the things, you will get expertise to get, pick up the abnormal thing. 
as a doctor kunal already cover he made my job easy because he uh, cover almost all the aspect of the normal head ultrasound and he as he told us that there would be the four window by which we can assess the head ultrasound the most common would be anterior frontal nail but sometimes we need to use the supplement uh, window like for example to assess the cerebral hemorrhage we need to use mustard window for we uh, rule out some article we need to use the posterior window sometimes we use the linear probe to rule out the extraaxial fluid specifically in the preterm baby or sub adult hemorrhage in which we need to use the linear transducer in doppler of course we have two option anterior cerebrality and middle cerebrality we'll discuss in the further slides okay so before i jump into the normal uh, uh, this ivh thing First, I need to discuss the normal ventricular anatomy. It will take another five to ten minutes. But if you know the things, then it is easy for you to identify the abnormal thing. So, as you see the uh, in the video, that that is your third ventricle. This is your third ventricle, okay? And it connects with your fourth ventricle by aqueduct. So, this is your side view, okay? So, when you see from the front. you can see this is your third ventricle which connect with your fourth ventricle with the aqueduct okay here your foramen minor is there by which you can connect by uh, by which the third ventricle will connect with the lateral ventricle okay so let me put the pointer so you can okay so most important point to be remember when you do the mid sagittal view as dr uh, kunal already uh, teaches you can't see the lateral ventricle that most important point to be remember okay in mid sagittal view you only see the third ventricle and the fourth ventricle and the aqueduct that point has to be remember so this is your third ventricle this is your uh, aqueduct and this is your fourth ventricle okay now i am adding the four lateral ventricle over here this is again the side view of your lateral ventricle this is your front facing view okay so when you move the probe from mid line towards the lateral ventricle you are going to see the crescent shape of the lateral ventricle like over here okay so which are the part of the lateral ventricle this is your frontal horn of the lateral ventricle this is your body of the lateral ventricle this is your posterior horn of the lateral ventricle and this is your inferior horn of the lateral ventricle and this part would be occipital part of the your lateral ventricle okay so your foramen minor is over here which connect the third third and lateral ventricle over here okay so everyone get it this is your mid ventricle frontal horn of the lateral ventricle foramen minor posterior horn okay so two point has to be remember when you do the sagittal view in mid sagittal view you only see the third and the fourth ventricle in the lateral ventricle view you can see crescent shape lateral ventricle okay now i am adding the basal ganglia and the cerebellum you can see so we'll take one one by one picture so when you put the cerebellum over here the cerebellum is actually the posterior to the fourth ventricle okay in front of the fourth ventricle you can see the mid brain or we call as a um brain stem okay so now when i add the quadrant nuclei uh, sorry basal ganglia it does look like over here from the side okay so as we know that this is your frontal horn of the lateral ventricle and adjust to this structure is quadrant nucleus this is a very important point to be remember when then there is a your thalamus over here which is rounded structure the quadrant nucleus would be the crescent shape and your thalamus would be the rounded structure and it is adjacent to your posterior horn of the lateral ventricle this is your posterior horn of the lateral ventricle in front of them there is a thalamus okay so when you see from the front it does look like this this is your frontal horn of the lateral ventricle this is your quadrant nucleus this is your brain stem and this is your cerebellum okay so now i added both lateral ventricle and you can see from the fear in front side so and even from the uh, delicates what would be in between that one this is your frontal horn of your lateral ventricle what would be in between that anyone from the audience so that is your septum pellucidum so this is a hollow area in between that one 
if it is preterm then it always fill up with the water or fluid not water but fluid that's why we call it as a k1 septum pellucidum and just above that one there would be your corpus callosum okay so we'll discuss further so in initial slide we discuss the lateral ventricle third ventricle fourth ventricle anatomy then follow by we added the basal ganglia and follow by we added the cerebellum now i am going to add the cerebrum okay this is your frontal lobe occipital lobe this is your temporal lobe and this is your parietal lobe so how the structure is organized now you can see this is your uh, cerebe cerebrum okay this is your green structure you can see this green structure is actually corpus callosum which we con that connect the both cerebrum now the space between the lateral ventricle would be septum pellucidum this is your lateral ventricle this is your caudate nucleus and this is your thalamus okay this is your brain stem and this is your cerebellum so now you know that how the anatomy of the cerebral hemisphere is there how the corpus callosum looks in the image septum pellucidum all the things you need to you know keep in your mind to get the diagnosis okay now i would like to discuss few view which is very important for in view of the ivh diagnosis so this is the two view which is most confusing this is your your coronal view forearm and munro on the left side and right side mid ventricle view and this there is a minor difference between that one which are those you can see in the mid ventricle view there is some echo density area over here like in, on the concave border of your lateral ventricle which is not present over here in the normal x ray i'm talking about the normal uh, preterm baby okay so what is that this is not your ivh this is not grade one ivh this is your tip of your coronal plexus okay the second difference would be here your inferior horn of the lateral ventricle is rounded shape in the mid ventricular view it does not appear over here or maybe you can see small, smaller size so these two major difference between the mid ventricular and the foramen minor why it is important we'll discuss in the ivh okay this is your mid sagittal view as we discussed in mid sagittal view we can't see the lateral ventricle and is this image is matched with over here you can see this is your corpus callosum and this hollow area is not your lateral ventricle please remember beginner mostly confused with the lateral ventricle but this is your septum pellucidum which we fill with the fluid okay this is your foramen munro okay and this is your third ventricle over here it connect with your fourth ventricle uh, through the aqueduct this is your cerebellum like over here and this is your brain stem over here okay so it is a very simple thing when you do the repeatedly you can aware that what which structure you are going to encounter this is another important view sagittal lateral ventricular view and uh, already uh, from the audience they ask what's the important of the ctg okay so look over here this is the your uh, lateral ventricle view here there is your caudate nuclei uh, sorry thalamus which is adjacent to your posterior horn of the lateral ventricle and here the your caudate plexus is there okay this is your crescent shaped caudate cord nucleus which is adjacent to your frontal horn and this is your caudothalamic groove okay why is it important because adjacent to your caudate nucleus would be your germinal matrix so your germinal matrix would be over here which is more prone for the bleeding okay so that's why dr kunal told us that if you find the echogenicity like why like over here you can see this is your caudate plexus and it has the same echogenicity like a blot in your brain okay so if you see the echogenicity in front of your caudothalamic groove that means this is not a part of the caudate plexus that is a part of your bleed okay so you can see the echo the echo density is not extending further from the ctg you can see this is a deep over here but it is limited till over here so that means this head uh, ultrasound is normal it is not a ivs this is your caudate plexus okay now let's discuss about the ivs i am not going to discuss any pathology but i need to just stimulate that this is the most common neurological complication in the preterm baby why is it so it is because of the germinal matrix 
and germinal matrix it is actually the fetal tissue it is not like a full term baby you can see okay it is a precursor of the many neurological cells and it is important for the neuro development outcome okay why is it fragile first of all because there would be the lack of supporting tissue okay they could not uh, tolerate the fluctuation in the blood pressure could not uh, uh, tolerate the fluctuation of blood so there are more tendency to the bleed there would be the long list for the bleeding like it is called risk factor so uh, it is common in the less than 32 weaker 1.5 kg uh, if there is a rapid change of the blood pressure blood volume or any hypoxic ischemic event rds it, itself not causing the ivh but because of the ventilation you might face the hypercardia or hypocardia that leads to your ivh where is coagulopathy specifically in the developing country it is difficult to transfer the extreme preterm life specific lesion 26 weeks from periphery to center so that handling also could not tolerate by the preterm baby and end up with the ivh so these are long 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 list for the risk factor okay so now main thing how do you identify the ivh okay so doc this is your foramen mineral view okay and this is your chordate nucleus and this is your lateral ventricle as i told you the adjacent structure to your chordate nucleus is your germinal matrix and which is the most common site for the ivh so you have you might see the echo density white is right structure over here in the concave border of your lateral ventricle that is a common site for the ivh as you can see over here you can see bright structure when the blade is fresh you always see the brighter structure equal to or more than brightness of your chordate plexus so this is your ivh which is your concave border of your lateral ventricle okay what happen if we follow that one most of time it become equilution within it and follow by it resolve so depend on the grading we'll discuss further how does it look from your sagittal view okay so this is your lateral ventricle view in which you can't see the third and fourth fourth ventricle you only see the crescent shaped lateral ventricle and as we discuss the adjacent structure to the chordate nucleus is frontal horn of lateral ventricle and your germinal matrix so again the blade would be start from here okay in front of your chordothalamic groove so how does it look in real image you can see over here this is your chordal plexus and as we discuss that it has a equal echogenicity with the chordal plexus and your blade and you can see your blade already cross your chordothalamic groove so this is your grade 1 ivh it is not part of your chordal plexus so you always see in the inferior border of your lateral ventricle anterior to your chordothalamic groove either we can call notch also okay so which are the classification there is a world wide two accepted classification one is pair papilla classification which is based on your ct scan and volpe classification which is based on ultrasound both are widely accepted everywhere and you can follow either of that okay so if i talk about the papilla classification the grade one means the bleed remain in your germinal matrix okay blood is not going to leak out your lateral ventricle that is your grade one ivh if your bleed is leak out into the, your ventricular cavity but it is not that much sufficient amount that can cause the ventricular dilatation that is your grade 2 ivh okay the blood is leak out into the ventricle but it is very sufficient amount can cause the ventricular dilatation that is your grade 3 uh, ivh and the most important point to be remember in grade three that the dilatation must be by blood not by your csf okay in grade four what is the grade four when you see the blood outside of your lateral ventricle like in the parenchyma that is your grade four i what about the volpe classification which is based on your ultrasound so if you find the bleeding in the germinal matrix with or without there would be minimal leaking of the blood into your lateral ventricle which would be less than 10% of your ventricular area that is your grade 1 ivh when the bleed is increase more than 10% but up to 50% that is your grade 2 ivh okay when your bleeding is more than 50% 
more than 50% of of the 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 area and with the dilatation of the late ventricle, left, uh, lateral ventricle that is your grade three IVF. And when you find the bleeding in the surrounding parenchyma, that is your grade four IVF. Nowadays, people are not using the grade four IVF as a label. They generally used to used to label as a grade three IVF plus periventricular white matter injury or either grade one IVF with the periventricular white matter injury because grade one can cause your grade four IVF or peri uh, parenchymal hemorrhage. It's not necessary to follow the sequence like grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four. We'll discuss in the grade four IVH. Okay, so let's talk about the grade one IVH. How does it look? So this is your coronal section of your fetal brain. You can see your blade is driven into the germinal matrix. It is not leak out into your lateral ventricle. That is your grade one IVH. So how does it look on the coronal view? Coronal, forearm, and Monroe view. You can see the echogenicity over here, which is your inferior or concave border of your lateral ventricle. And you can see the blood is not leak out in your lateral ventricle. That is your grade one IVX. Again, in the uh, parasagittal view, you can see this is your lateral ventricle. Okay, this is your frontal horn, body, posterior horn, and this is your inferior horn. This is your choroid plexus. Now, echogenicity is crossing your CT region. You can see over here. Okay, that is your grade one IVH. This is your caudate nucleus and this is your thalamus. Now, most common misinterpretation, as we know, that when you look for the Puram and Munro view, someone can say this is your choroid plexus, someone can say this is your grade one IVH. So, it is always the subjective finding. So, that's why we need to see the bleeding in other view also. Like, for example, this is your mid ventricular view because your lateral ventricle, inferior on the lateral ventricle is rounded shape over here. This is your white dot over here. This is looks like a uh, choroid plexus tip. Okay. And over here, this is your threshold shape of your lateral ventricle, which we need to, we can see in the forum and Munro. But it is always subject to find it because there is a minor difference between that one. To rule out the grade one IVF, we have to do the parasagittal view. And over here, you can see your echogenicity is not extending further, okay, from the CTG, okay. So that is means this echogenicity in your coronal view, that is your tip of your coronal plexus, it is not part of your IVH, okay. Now you can see in this image, this is your coronal plexus and again, your echodensity is crossing your CTG. So this is your part of the IVH not a part of the choroid plexus. Okay. So if your echo density is crossing the CTG, that is your grade one IVH. Okay. So, if, so what happens if we follow that uh, IVH, grade one IVH? Most of the time it resolves and it has an excellent neurodevelopment outcome. It hardly causes the ventricular dilation, which would be less than 3%. Okay. So if I summarize the grade one in coronal view, from Mundro in either mid ventricle view, you can see the echo density in the lateral wall of the lateral ventricle. Pairing parasagittal view, your bleeding is limited to the like anterior to the your CTG, but no blood leak out into the lateral ventricle. And most common misinterpretation is grade one IVH versus anterior tip of the choroid plexus in the coronal view. You already discussed that one. So how does look the grade two IVH? So you can see over here the now bleeding is leak out into the your lateral ventricle and how does it look on the coronal view? So you can see this is your echo density over here, which is not present in other side. This is your CSF, okay? And it is not covering the more than 50% of the your area. So this is your grade 2 IVH, okay? How does it look on the parasagittal view? You can see that it is blood is leak out into your lateral ventricle but it could not cause the ventricular dilatation. It looks like a normal size and of course it is not cover the more than 50% area of your lateral ventricle. So that is your grade 2 IVH. Okay. Now when there is a bleeding into the lateral ventricle, we know that blood is more heavier than your CSF. Okay. So sometimes because of the gravitational force, it goes into the posterior horn of your lateral ventricle. So when you swipe 
when you swipe the uh, you know a probe toward the posterior side you can see your choroid plexus over here and you can see some echogenicity uh, adjacent to your choroid plexus that is your part of your ivh okay so you can see based in the foramen uh, based in the posterior horn view as compared to the foramen mundro view if i talk about the grade 2 ivh but how does it look based a uh, grade 2 IV in which view the most common and best view would be your parasitic view again you can see your blade primary bleeding site is over here but blade is too much that it because of the gravitational force the blood is leaked out towards your posterior horn of your lateral ventricle over here okay so this is your choroid plexus and this is your blade okay but it is not that much sufficient amount that can cause the ventricular dilatation so that is your grade 2 IVH Okay, this is because of the gravitational force. Now, there is some confusion always is happen when the blood is mixed with the choroid plexus. Someone say it is a part of the choroid plexus, someone say it is a part of the IVS. Then how do you differentiate? So when your choroid plexus it has a smooth surface, as you can see in this image, the choroid plexus is a smooth image. So you can differentiate the blood and choroid plexus by this equilibrium line in between that one. That is uh your ivh okay this is your equilibrium we separate your choroid plexus and the blood what if your choroid plexus has an irregular surface like you can compare this both image this is irregular surface this is also irregular image so irregular surface sorry so how will you know that does it part of the choroid plexus or does it part of the ivh okay so when you when you do the parasagittal view, if you find any echo density in other part of your lateral ventricle, that means this part is always the part of IVS, not part of the choroid plexus. Okay, but in this image, you can't see any bleeding in other part of the lateral ventricle. That means this is your part of your choroid plexus, and mostly we call it as a bulky choroid plexus. You know, regularly, regularly sometimes. Uh, they say they uh, label as a bulky choroid plexus. Does it part of the blade? No. In extreme term, you might see or you might encounter the bulky, bulky choroid plexus. Okay. Again, it would be the fragile uh, thing to bleed. But in this image, we can't say that is a grade 2 IVH. This is your part of your choroid plexus. Okay. Sometimes, because of the gravitational force, the bleed is separate from the main clot. Over here, like you can see here, there is an echogenicity area in the occipital horn of the, your lateral ventricle. And we always consider, does it part of the uh, IVH or does it artifact? Because sometimes, because of the artifact, you can see the echodense area over here. So how will you read out same thing? If you find any bleeding in other part of your lateral ventricle, that means that is your isolated echogenicity related to the IVH and if you could not found any any other side you know bleeding any other side that means that, that it has a no value over here okay so what happened if we follow this uh, IVH most of time again it resolve 11 to 12 percent rate for the ventricular dilatation so this is your ventricular dilation you can really see that this is your lateral ventricle this is your foramen neuron this is your third ventricle this is your inferior horn of the lateral ventricle okay and it has a good outcome if we compare with the grade 2 and grade 4 IVH. So if, if I summarize that in grade 2 IVH, in coronal view, either either of foreign Munro or mid ventricle view, you can see echo density a clot into the ventral ventricle, which does not cover more than 50% area, or it, it should be without dilatation. In grade 2 IVH, you also see in the posterior horn view, because of the gravitational force of the blood, you can see some echo density area adjacent to your choroid plexus. Of course, the base view would be your parasitical view to label as a grade 2 IVH, which would be without ventricular dilatation. And as we discussed, the most common misinterpretation would be because of the, it has the same echo density as the choroid plexus. If your choroid plexus surface is smooth, you can differentiate with the equilibrium line. If your surface is irregular, then look for the IVH in other part of the lateral ventricle. If it is there, that means that is a part of the uh, IVH, not part of the choroid plexus. If if there is a uh, echo density or isolated echo density in occipital horn of the lateral ventricle, again look for the bleeding in other part of the 
lateral ventricle if it is there then that means this is a part of the grade for ivh it is grade 2 ivh it is not your artifact now let's uh, look on the grade 3 ivh how does it look okay you can see over here there is a bleed not only in the germinal matrix but also leak out in the lateral ventricle and it causes uh, sufficient dilatation over here even though the blood is extended over here in the third ventricle that is your foramen minero monero okay so how does it it look on the image this is your coronal view mid ventricle or now you have more bleeding so it is doesn't matter that you are doing the uh, foramen monero view or mid ventricle view you can seen either of view so this is your bleeding which cover more than 50% of the area even though your bleeding is extend into the third ventricle to the foramen monero okay how does it look on the parasympathetic view you can see there is a big dilatation over here and your bleeding is also like big size it has the same shape as a lateral ventricle you know that is your grade 3 ivh and the most important point to be remember your dilatation must be by the blood not by the csf okay now there is a few things we need to uh, remember that most most of time when you are beginner you might misclassify the grade 2 and grade 3 ivh because there is also few confusion all the time why is it so because in the original article they could not decide the cut off point grade 2 versus grade 3 second most important thing they they haven't clarify that dilatation is by blood or by the csf of course when we go through when we went through the original article the ct scan show the blood so we presume that the dilatation must be by the blood and the last most important thing which might we might facing in our daily routine like old grade 2 ivh present with the dilated ventricles due to the obstruction we mostly most commonly you know the radiology person when you do, when you, in your unit when they do uh, means uh, the radiologist doing a head and sound they always label as a ivh plus ventricular dilatation so we do the counseling according to the grade three ivh which has a poor outcome but we haven't know that what would be the initial bleeding you know so make sure that your bleeding your ble uh, your ventricular dilation would be by the blood not by the csf so this is one of the example that this is your grade 2 ivh and when you follow you can see the ventricular dilatation of course it has a good outcome as compared to the grade 3 ivh okay so if i summarize the thing in the foramen monero or mid ventricular coronal view blood dilates the ventricle this which is a very important thing to be remember in parasympathetic view clot is modulated to shape of the lateral ventricle of course because the bleeding is more than 50% and most common misinterpretation as we discussed grade 2 post hemorrhagic ventricular dilation versus grade 3 so make sure that your dilatation must be by the blood then you can label as a grade 3 ivh so how does the grade 4 ivh looks you can see in this uh, coronal section of the uh, brain that blood is not only remain into the lateral ventricle but is also leak out outside of your lateral ventricle so parenchyma is already involved so that is your grade 4 ivh so how does look on your image you can see the echo density is not only remain in the lateral ventricle but is also leak out around the periventricular area that is your grade 4 ivh how does it look on the parasympathetic view you can't see the lateral ventricle it is full of the blood and outside your a uh, lateral ventricle also you can see lots of echo density so there is a large infarct or we can call hemorrhage over here so this is your grade 4 ivh okay now how do how does it start okay if you see over here this is your foramen monero view and as we know that most common ivh is going to be happen on this side because of the germinal matrix when there is a dilatation of your or distension of your germinal matrix you of course obstruct your venous return over here and because of that you can see that there is a hemorrhagic venous infarct is going to be happen this is most common sequence for that so that's why it is not necessary that your ivh is grade for ivh is always follow the three so it can happen after grade one also okay sometime when you do the scan on day 1 you might see the periventricular flare over here 
okay this is not ivh but you can see there is a brighter structure in the corner of your lateral ventricle it does not seen over here over here okay so sometimes it might be precursor of your grade 4 ivh okay sometimes it might be the artery artifact sometimes it precursor of the pvl also so a pvl patient if you see if you follow from day 1 you might see the periventricular flag in first seven days and follow by full fledged pvl after two weeks but we have not done so in this case we need to follow and sometime you might encounter the grade 4 ivg on day 2 because of the distension of the grade uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage and which cause the venous uh, obstruction and follow by the infarct okay so it is not necessary that you find always the grade 4 directly same thing with the para sagittal you can see periventricular flare over here and we if we follow the things then you can see the grade 4 ivh over here okay so this is another example you can see the bleed not only in the lateral ventricle also extend outside of your lateral ventricle and over here also okay so what happen if we follow this grade 4 ivh most of time it convert into the porencephaly and sometimes it merge with your lateral ventricle over here so it has a very poor outcome if you face the grade 4 ivh so till now what we learn the grade 1 as we know in the coronal view you can see echo density area in the concave border of your lateral ventricle which mimics with the tip of your choroid plexus but for that we need to do the parasagittal view this is a grade 2 ivh which is limited less than 50% of area of lateral ventricle without any dilatation this is your grade Ah, uh, 3 IVH which cover more than 50% of your bleeding area with the ventricular dilatation, and the last, not the least, this is your grade 4 IVH which uh, echo density is not only in the lateral ventricle but also outside of your lateral ventricle. That is, we call periventricular white matter injury. And as we discuss, it is not necessary that it follow one, two, three, four. It might be happen one directly four. in parasagittal how does it look as we know if your echo density crossing uh, ctg that is your grade 1 ivh in grade 2 you can see more bleeding in the posterior horn of your lateral ventricle echo density mix with your choroid plexus but without any ventricular dilatation if it is cover more than 50% of area with the ventricular dilatation that is your grade 3 ivh and this is your grade 4 in which you can see the bleeding outside of your lateral ventricle okay So what next? What happened if we follow this uh, idea? As we know, the blood and clot is very very sticky, and it always releases lots of inflammatory markers and ultimately lead to the chronic inflammation. And that sticky thing might block your channel also. So there would be the imbalance between the production and absorption. It has also like a free radical injury, which uh, you know because of the iron, which leads from your hemoglobin. and ultimately overall it end up with your hydrocephalus or either ventricular dilatation and this can cause your white matter injury we are not going to discuss any pathology uh, so let's speak on your uh, assessment so all the ventricular dilatation is not hydrocephalus okay but when you see the ventricular dilatation we have to encounter that does it because of your raised internal pressure or does it because your of your occupying space due to injury to the surrounding brain so how you differentiate by the doing the head ultrasound we'll discuss in the next slide also we need to look for the normal variant for example in the term baby you hardly see the ventricles okay and in preterm baby sometimes you can see the asymmetry and mostly the left side would be the bigger okay so how will you uh, diagnose the origin so if you see in this image this is your ventricular dilatation is there and you can see the you have to see the lateral wall of your lateral ventricle if this is your con it is if it is concave surface that means it is because of the parenchymal injury okay this is most important point to be remember if there is a raised internal pressure your lateral wall of your lateral ventricle would be convex surface so that is because of your ivh or because of any other reason of the raised internal pressure okay so if you see the concave again it is because of the parenchymal injury if you it is a convex that is because of your raised internal pressure okay this is your term baby scan you can see that the you hardly see the lateral ventricle okay that is your normal ventricle there is a lots of sulca in gyra you can see when you do the scan on the term baby and in the preterm baby sometimes you encounter the 
asymmetry of the lateral ventricle. Mostly it would be normal, but still we need to follow it until the, your baby become term. So that is your preterm asymmetry lateral ventricle. So what's the ratio of the post hemorrhagic ventral ventricular direction? As we know, the grade one and grade two has a minimal, but in grade three, grade four, it would be 70 to 75 percent. So how will you monitor the clinically? As we know, we used to start the head circumference daily once we encounter the IVS and we follow the head circumference. Which are the other symptoms? Apnea, bradycardia, tachycardia, bulging of the AF, uh, widening of the suture. There is a long list for the monitoring. But does it enough to monitor? Because when you encounter the excessive rising of the head circumference, head circumference the damage is already done. Because your skull of the preterm is very compliant, okay? So you hardly uh, see what is going on in into the, uh, you know, inside if you stick on your head circumference. So that's why the ultrasound is coming to the picture in which you can diagnose the early post hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation. And if you diagnose early, you can enter in the early. Uh, you can have a three option like number puncture, or either we maybe need a frequent number puncture, we need to think about the reserve hour or either certain surgery. And if we intervene the timely, then it has a good outcome. Okay. So this is your grade two IVH. And if you follow over here, it ultimately resolves after a few days because it would be it has a you know less chances to have a uh, post hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation. How will you monitor it? In the by doing ultrasound, so five parameter you need to monitor most commonly is a ventricular index, which is what mostly widely accepted all over the world. Second would be the anterior horn width. Third would be third ventricular dilatation. Fourth is thalamo occipital distance, and fifth would be the resistive index in AC and MCA. Okay, so how frequent you need to do the ultrasound? There will be no any coffee guideline when. There is the IVH and how frequent we need to do. But of course, initially you need to do the alternative or daily unless the IVH is settled down and then follow by twice a week and up to 32 weeks and follow by once a week until term age. So it is a, by default we need to follow that guideline. What should we follow? Which parameter is abnormal? So most commonly while accepted parameter is 11 index. We'll discuss in the next slide. And what will be the action line? Number puncture or reservoir or either the sun survey. So let's talk about the ventricle index. How does it look and where, where, which view we can measure. So this is your forearm and Munro view and this is your threshold shape, the lateral ventricle, okay? So you can see there is a ventricular dilatation over here. If I uh, make it bigger, then the, you need to take a measurement from interhemispheric fissure or either we call Fox cerebri to your lateral wall of your lateral ventricle. Okay, so you can get the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the number over in your corner. So what, which are the limitations? So first limitation would be if you have a grade 4 IVH and sometimes you encounter the pore and cephaly and sometimes it merge with the lateral ventricle. So we do not have any lateral wall over here to measure that one. So you need to, you know, work, you need to enter based on your other side of your lateral ventricle. Second important thing, when there is a collection of the fluid is start, it always collects in the occipital horn of the lateral ventricle and then it comes into the picture. So sometimes it might be late even though you measure the ventricular index from the first day. Okay. So uh, this is your level index, what we should follow. So this is your ventricular index number over here and this is your gestational age. And there is a two line over here. This is your 97 centile and this is your 97 plus 4 centile. So you can follow either of that one. It is not necessary that we can follow 91, 97 plus 4. Both have an excellent outcome if you uh, intervene in timely manner. So let's uh, discuss the one example which we faced, I think, last month. This is your our 37, one, uh, 37 plus 1 week baby, gestational age. It ha Baby have already have a diagnosis of ventricular dilation antenatally because of the equiductal stenosis or either because of the intrauterine hemorrhage and on day first within a one hour when we did the scan we can see the parameter over here the 23 mm and 19.9 mm of the vi and in our unit we put the ventricular index on the paper so no need to see the graph all the time 
and this may be 37 plus 1 weaker over here. So if you put over here, this is your 17.1 is the cutoff for the intervention. So in this baby, we did the CT scan to know that does it communicating hydrocephalus or it is non communicating Because it is non communicating the lumbar puncture is not going to be help us. So luckily, we got the communicating hydrocephalus. We did the lumbar puncture. We removed the fluid 20 ml per kg. And you, you can see post lumbar puncture, the parameter is decreased from 23 to 20 and 19.9 to 18. But still, it is in a higher number. So we can't do the lumbar puncture every six hours. We have to wait another 12 hours or 24 hours. So we did repeatedly. Ultimately, it become, uh, you know, within a control limit, within a few lumbar puncture. Which are other parameters we can uh, measure the anterior horn width. And again, we need to use, again, forum and Munro view. And you can assess the point from maximum diagonal width of anterior horn at its widest point, like from here to here. Okay, you can see the parameter, which is also a high number. Anything more than 6 mm, that means that you need to intervene as in urgent basis. In third ventricular, uh, how will you measure the third ventricular uh, diameter? In same view, over here, this is your foramen mundrovi and this is your third ventricle. So you can measure it at its widest point. Anything more than 3 mm, again, it is in the red flag sign. Here it is a 12.9, so it is already high. And last indices would be uh, is thalamo occipital distance. So you need to measure from your posterior part of your thalamus to your occipital horn over here. So how can you measure on the ultrasound? This is your posterior part of your thalamus from here to occipital horn of your lateral ventricle. Okay. Don't consider this forehead plexus to measure. Okay. So if anything more than 26 mm, again, it is has a, you know, we need to enter in, in urgent basis. Over here, it is a 35. Okay. So if I summarize the red flag, if you have a, if your baby has a ventricle index more than 97 plus 4 m centile, if your anterior horn with more than 6 mm, if your third ventricle dilates is more than 3 mm, if your thalamate or occipital distance more than 26 mm, then in that case, we need to do the intervention as early as possible to get a good neural development outcome. This is one of the articles by which you can divide your patient in the green, yellow, and the red zone. So if your baby's VI is less than 97 centile, then this baby requires only the monitoring. If your baby has a uh, VI is more than 97 centile, with or without the symptom, this baby might require the lumbar puncture initially, and we need to close follow up the baby, and we need to shift this baby where the neurosurgical intervention is possible. If your baby has a more than 97 percentile plus 4 mm of the you know parameter, then definitely you need to intervene intervene the early basis, and we need to think about the VP shunt and reservoir if it is not resolved with the lumbar puncture. Okay. So this is your indices. The life indices is the resistive index. So as we know that previously, you know, Dr. Kiran Morris sir already discussed about the how to measure the cardiac output, how to measure the right ventricle output. Why we it is not possible in the brain. So to measure the any output, we need two things. One is the diameter and one is your velocity. So if I talk about the diameter of the cerebral vessel, it has very small diameter. So it is impossible to measure the diameter. Second thing, you can measure the velocity, but their velocity is very low. Okay. And there is a, no any, uh, like there would be the complicated, complicated relationship between the end systolic and diastolic and the mid velocity. It is difficult to measure the velocity and rely on that one. For example, if you measure the high velocity, your cerebral blood flow might be high or maybe normal. Okay. So that's why the resistive index is coming to the picture. So resistive index is equal to N systolic volume minus N diastolic volume divided by your N systolic volume. So N diastolic volume is the pre prediction of your resistance. If your resistance in the brain is increased, the N diastolic volume is going to be down. Okay. Other parameter may be affected by your blood, hemoglobin, polycythemia, and PDA. But end diastolic volume is reflect your resistance. As we know, the normal value would be 0.55 to 0.65. And if you find the RI more than 0.85, that means there would be the raised intracranial pressure. If your RI is more than one, that means that suggests you have impaired the cerebral perfusion. So how do you measure? We have two options. Anterior cerebral artery. 
Sawil is nicer that one in the mid sagittal view. You can see the anterior cerebral artery over here. So when this is arise from the internal carotid artery, it travel medially, and once it reaches to the interhemispheric fissure, it it travels to like in the superior side in the medial surface of your interhemispheric fissure over here, and it becomes straight over here in the front of your genu. That is we call corpus callosum. Okay, so that's why we need to put. The pulse wave window over here because it is a straight and so angle of insulation is less, less than twenty percent. So you can get the accurate uh, value. So once you do the pulsar Doppler, you can see the systolic and diastolic wave over here. And once you click the RI, you need to put two two point and systolic volume and diastolic uh, uh, point, and you can get the RI over here, which would be point six seven in this case. Okay. Now, how you measure the MCA? Again, in the sphenoid view, you need to put the probe marker in in the face tracing, and you can see this is your MCA. Okay, so the, it has a straight course, and uh, again, it is the largest artery in the brain. So that's why people some some of the people are follow the MCA. Okay, how does it look? Again, same wave and systolic and diastolic, and again, you can get the parameter. So let's talk about this previous case which we discussed. So when the baby is born and when there is a VI is more than like ninety seven plus four centile, in that case when I measure the RI, it was one because there is an absent diastole over here. You can't see the diastolic flow over here. Okay, so already baby is compromised in utero and after birth there is a still the perfusion is not up to the mark into the in the brain. So once I did the lumbar puncture. After that, the RI is drastically improved. Okay, so now you can see there is a diastolic flow over here, and when I measure the RI, it went down to 0.69. Okay, so that is the advantage of your ultrasound that you can enter in the early, and you you will get chance to get a good neuro development outcome in all these babies. So if I summarize the indices in coronal foramen minerum, you can assess the uh, VI, which is from the intercerebral. Of interhemispheric fissure to your little wall of little ventricle, you can also measure the anterior horn width over here, and you can measure the third ventricular dilatation over here. To get the four indices, we need to do the parasagittal view, in which you need to put put the two points from posterior horn, posterior part of your thalamus to your occipital horn of your little ventricle, and you will get the number. Okay, and this is your last slide that when you put the mastoid view. You you have to rule out the cerebellar hemorrhage. This is your normal view. You can see this normal cerebellum over here. There is your vermis over here. Once you encounter the hemorrhage, you can see same echogenesis like we see in the IVH over here. This is your cerebellar hemorrhage. Okay. So take home message from now from my side that it is a very useful tool. You can do the multiple ultrasonography at bedside. No chances of the radiation exposure. It is most sensitive tool for the IVH screening, and it can helpful to follow the IVH and the hydrocephalus. Try to use the supplement view and the Doppler for basically the to uh, you know assess the MCA flow or either rule out the cerebral hemorrhage. We need to do the mastoid view. We need to do the posterior uh, view to rule out certain artifact. Of course, it has a less sensitive for the white matter injury, posterior fossa infarction, and HI. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Great. Any any questions? Nice talk, Vishal. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> now, any questions? Any question till now? I almost try to cover in half an hour, but it is something you know. It in the rush, it is difficult to explain all the things. <laughs> no, I think this is the best uh, we can cover in such a short period of time. and i know it's a lot of information we are sharing in last uh, two sessions today mm -hmm. also we have a marathon of lectures four lectures back to back so but but mm -hmm. the workshops are there to stimulate uh, uh for you to go back and read and go back and practice and learn yes, more so i think you guys have got a really good stimulus Vilas, you have anything else to say otherwise i'll just sum up uh, as a synopsis no sir you can continue <laughs> we share the link of recorded lecture
So are we sharing the link of recorded lectures to them? Yes, sir. We'll uh, share tomorrow. Okay. So you'll get the link yeah. tomorrow. So you can go back. But uh, I mean, yeah, echo and point of kill ultrasound. Uh, we've tried to cover the basics. There's more to it when we go deeper into it and uh, look at the cases. Yes, and again, it's a matter of practice. So, um, uh, so last two days we have covered lots of things. So just quickly recapping two, three minutes. So can somebody tell, I mean, somebody who's starting to do fresh can, uh, summarize all the basic views, uh, we do, what are the bare minimum views we need to do for a functional assessment? What are the views? Can somebody just unmute and, uh, speak up? Because now we are going to meet directly in the workshop. So just a recap you are trying to do. Or is it enough for today? <laughs> Nobody wants to answer. Okay, somebody is typing. Okay, either type. Nobody wants to volunteer. Okay, I mean, so segmental sequential scanning has got lots of views, but... Uh, Okay, Vishal, we can go Vishal, that's fine. I'm just summing up. So uh, basically the bare minimum views are the apical four chamber, five chamber, parasternal long axis, short axis. Uh, these are the bare minimum view and then suprasternal uh, views for the uh, aorta and the ductal cut and subcostal PFO. So these are the sort of basic things. Then in every view, there are additional things which you can look at. Uh, uh, which, you know, we generally talk in the advanced sessions. Uh, then I think we learned PDA, PPHN and echo indices. Yeah, there's a, another meeting going on simultaneously. So everyone is wrapping up. Uh, so I, I, I think uh, what we'll do is in the workshop, we'll go over the basic views first and then we'll have sessions to talk about each and every indices in uh, detail. Uh, we hope we'll have some cases to show, but otherwise we have lots of videos which we can show and explain you uh, what every individual indices uh, looks uh, like, you know, looks like. Okay, PFO versus ESD. Okay, good question. So uh, generally, uh, generally what we say is uh, PFO is uh, when we call basically the location uh, of the PFO and ASD can differ. ASDs are different types, uh, septum primum, septum secundum, sinus venosus. So sometimes the location varies, but many times ASD and PFO location can be same. If you see a flap, then likely to be it's a PFO. ASD is a fixed defect. You don't see a flap. Secondly, the size of the ASD is generally more than 3, 3.5 millimeters. And um, and then, uh, you know, the PFOs are generally smaller. So if you see a 4, 5, 6 millimeter, less likely it is a PFO, uh, uh, more likely it's an ASD. Having said that, there could be sometimes stretched ASD, stressed PFO, which can look like a larger ASD. So uh, many times it's clear cut uh, with no flap uh, and you can see a defect, but sometimes it's a gray zone, then you will see the cardiologist will write PFO stock ASD. You follow them up, PFO will close, ASD will remain open unless it the uh, device closed. So that's kind of a gross difference we talk about. Yes, POSA LS, PFO and ASD, uh, ASD and PFO will look like in the same uh, location, but ASD can be in the different, different locations. So we, maybe we can talk that during the bedside. Any other questions specific? So PPHNs uh, generally look at the tricuspid regurg look at the TRV max, you look at the tricuspid regurg in four chamber view or a parasitic long axis view, and then measure the pulmonary pressures. Uh, then you look at the velocities of the shunt velocities. Uh, sorry, I mean the direction of the shunt in the PDA, PFO, if it's bidirectional right to left, then you assess the function of the heart if your RV is uh, under pressure or not. What is the tap C? What is the tap C? Tapsy, anyone? Was it covered? Tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion. So yeah, correct. So Tapsy is a way of way the uh, right ventricle is contracting. So that will tell you if the contraction is enough or not. Uh, yeah. So if there is a dysfunction, then it will it will be abnormal. 
now pphl estimation on prz so most of the machines should have a uh, you have a pre calculated uh, software which will give you the gradient but simple formula is 4v square so you apply bernoulli's principle so what you do is the trz maximum velocity in meter per second you calculate so if your velocity is 4 meters per second the formula is 4v square so 4 square is 16 times 4 is 64 and then you add right atrial pressure which is generally 5 or 6 so suppose you add 6 then when you have a velocity of 4 meter per second peak velocity of trz4 your pressures will be 70 because it's 4 v square plus right atrial pressure that's how you measure the tricuspid uh, ventricular jet now okay pulmonary regurgitant jet so uh, i'll show you the slide so based on pulmonary regurgitant jet also there is a sort of similar formula you apply it's a good two ways there is one way is pulmonary regurgitant jet calculation there is another way is right to left pda uh, calculations Yeah, so basically it's a kind of a uh, similar sort of uh, uh, things you can, I'll show you this. Uh, one sec, I have to open up the... So the question is, I think everyone knows how to calculate the uh, TR jet based on the... Uh, based on the uh, sorry uh, pulmonary pressures based on the tr jet how the question is how do you calculate pphn based on the uh, pulmonary regurgitation jet so it's a very similar uh, sort of calculator let me just quickly open shock uh, pphn and where is my talk ah pphn indices one sec one sec Yeah, found it. Oops. Just give me one sec. My <laughs> slides are hang. Oh no. Oh no. Sorry, my PowerPoint is hung. I have to close it. I'll reopen it. Any other questions till then? I'm opening my slides. So PPHN we covered. PD, I think indices just covered today only. Um, Okay, so uh, okay, so the question was, how do you calculate the TRZ? How do you calculate the pulmonary pressure? So this one way is everyone aware, uh, where you have you have to have a nice tongue-shaped loop complete loop and then you measure the peak velocity where it is corresponding now here it is about 3.5 meters per second whatever the trv max is you basically add that into this formula 4v square and then add right atrial pressure and that will cover that will give you the 
Permi pressures. Now, and there are different ways of calculating. And then, then also flattening of the symptom, if it's a rounded shaped or D-shaped or crescentic shaped, will tell you if the pressures are normal, systemic or suprasystemic. And then this I will skip. Then the next thing is based on the other parameters. Direction of shunting will also tell you. If it's a bidirectional shunt, then you will uh, you know the pressures are systemic or suprasystemic. So you have a right to left shunt in systole and then left to right in diastole. So that tell you that pressures are systemic or suprasystemic. Now, this is also a cover. So this is this is now suppose you have a pulmonary sorry this is a bit blurred so this is a pulmonary artery there is the valve here normally you get a blue jet and you have a regurgitant jet uh, which is a pi pulmonary incompetence jet what you do is you do cw across that and you get a jet like this see normally your pulmonary artery vti will be like here Okay, below the below the line, but your regurgitant jet will be above. You do a PRV max here, and then you calculate the same formula: four v square, the v square of the four times the v square, and then you add the right atrial pressure to it, and that will give you your gradient. Okay, so that's that's kind of give you a gradient. So PR, PRV max, four v square, and plus RAP. Now there's one more way. If you have a right to left shunting across the PDA, complete right to left. So this is right to left complete. There is hardly any left to right. Then also you can do a weak pressure measurement here. And then what you do is, suppose your ductal velocity is 2.7 meters here, uh, and which is the peak velocity. Then what you do is, you square that 4V square, like similar to the, this, and you got suppose 29 or 30 here. And then, then you add systolic pressure to it because when you have a right to left shunt, you have to cross that systolic pressure to get the shunt completely across right to left. So pulmonary pressures has to be like 30 points above the systolic pressure. So that's why you add this 30 plus 40 and it's 69.3 or 30, 70 roughly. So these are the two different ways of measuring based on PIV max and based on uh, the right to left shunt. I hope that's clear. Okay, uh, next question is, okay, eyeballing is sufficient for telling PPHN in plaques? No, uh, it's not in plaques, it's in short. Uh -huh, sorry, PSX, not plaques. So it's not sufficient. A uh, lot of time you will see the cardiologist writing uh, PPHN pressures are moderate based on septal flattening. It is a surrogate. It, it will give you. But, you know, uh, many times the way you look at, the uh, way you scan, sometimes you can make the septum look flat. So don't jump on starting treatment just based on the septal flattening. You will have something, at least bidirectional PDA. You will have um, uh, some degree of TR and the indirect parameters like PAT, RVT ratio, the peak acceleration time to, time to uh, 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 total ejection time ratio will be low. So there will be some telltale signs and clinically there will be signs. So just based on septum, I wouldn't jump. But yeah, it is it helps if you have a really flatter and D-shaped ventricle, then it will help. Then for HSPD, do we need to measure RI in ACA? Uh, well, uh, ideally, yes. If you want to do a complete uh, comprehensive uh, this thing, uh, echo for uh, hemodynamic, it's not only the PDA, whether it's open or closed or the diameter, you need to know the pulsatility of the pattern, uh, 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 what it is. And then you need to have the echo parameters for systole, uh, uh, systemic steel and pulmonary overflooding. So one of the parameters for systemic steel is celiac and uh, SMA flow, sometimes renal flow, uh, flow as well, and MCA or ACA flow. Generally, your MCA and ACA don't uh, differ much. So if you're done MCA, you may not need to do ACA. So, resistive indices of the ACA can be calculated. If you calculated MCA, then it's fine. So, and uh, in significant uh, this thing, you will have a, um, you will have this thing. Uh, uh, some steel will be there. Some steel will be there. Your RI will be low. So, ideally, you need to do both SMA and um, this thing. 
one week or 10 days hands on focus is it possible sir yes possible you can contact us <laughs> and uh, or dr mohit uh, if you want to get more hands on experience and uh, the uh, what i was telling yeah so i think we cover pda parameters we already uh, as i said uh, so yeah diameter system hypotension then there are signs of pulmonary over flooding which also needs to looked at so which is like um, starting from high pulmonary veins velocity then coming to the la large la diameter so increase la ao ratio then large lv diameter so increased diameters or dimensions of the lv and then you have a uh, 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 signs of like sort of other signs of over circulation like uh, shorten IVRT, increase EA ratio, so in pseudo normalization of the EA ratio. So all these parameters once you do, then um, you can know that hemodynamic significant ductus or not. CURF lung ultrasound, how to approach uh, C what is CURF? I didn't understand. Can you specify what is CE? You can unmute and speak up. I think we are a small group. Happy to speak directly. It's a course of lung ultrasound. Yeah, yeah. So again, I mean, uh, we we do conduct uh, an echo and lung ultrasound and workshop. I don't know with, if somebody is running uh, only uh, lung ultrasound workshop, but yes, it's possible. Uh, lung ultrasound is one of the easiest one to learn. Probably in a week or two weeks time, you can uh, learn about it. Uh, you just need to see some different pathologies and uh, scoring for the RDS and all those things. So it's possible. We can discuss this once all of you are coming in the workshop. Sorry, I think everyone escaped. Hi, Vilas. My laptop died. So, hope you've summed up. Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Everyone is gone. <laughs> <laughs> sir, one or two people are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in the workshop. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. My thank laptop you. also gave away. Gave away. Okay, sir. No issue, sir. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Thank you.